recognize an extraordinary athlete, teacher, and coach who has left an indelible impact on the town of Hempstead. Former New York Nets player and current Floral Park resident, George Bruns, has been passing along his knowledge and wisdom for the game to the next generation of basketball stars at his youth sports camp in West Hempstead for the past four decades. In addition to his work for the town, for the past 17 years, George has coached the Manhasset Boys varsity basketball team and led them to the Nassau County Championship during the 2010 and 2011 season. George is held in such high regard by his peers in the community. Matthew Cody of the Garden City Estates Property Owners Association suggested that we honor George and said that he has been a guiding light for many young people who pursue the sport of basketball. Congratulations to George and his wife Elaine on a lifetime of success and for sharing your gifts and experience with our children and our families. We all thank you. I ask my colleagues if you'd like to come down. Supervisor, could, could I rise to a point of personal privilege for a minute? Uh, I would also like to uh, congratulate George Bruns, uh, who I know he was my son's shooting coach uh, a number of years ago because he's one of the most outstanding shooters that ever came out of the New York City uh, community of basketball. Uh, he's been a coach uh, in Nassau County for a long time. I've coached against him. I was actually at the game this past uh, Saturday when Manhasset High School was playing Malvern High School, I used to be the assistant coach at Malvern. They've gotten a lot better since I've retired. And uh, basically, it was a, uh, a very close game. It was tied with about 14 seconds left. And George lost his whole starting five last year, so he had a, a completely new starting five. And Malvern has a very young team. I think they start two sophomores. And uh, what's interesting about the game was, actually it was very exciting, was with four seconds left, one of the Malvern players took a shot from half court and banked it in so that Malvern won. So obviously I was happy for that. Felt bad for you, George. But George is one of the nicest guys and one of the best uh, teachers, not only in sports, but you know, life experiences to our young people that we have in Nassau County. So thank you uh, for recognizing George, and I certainly join with you in that praise of George and all of his members.
All right, good morning. I'd like to welcome everyone to this regularly scheduled town board meeting. For those of you who have never attended a town board meeting before, we will have a public hearing followed by an administrative calendar. What? There are meeting agendas yeah. available in the yeah. yeah. pavilion. If you'd like to be heard on any matter, please fill out a form and hand it to our public safety officer. Uh, after the meeting is adjourned, the town board will follow our custom. Uh, to remain in session and hear any residents who'd like to address the board on other matters. Madam Clerk, will you please call the roll? Supervisor Gill? Here. Councilman Pleak? Here. Councilman Diaz Fazio? I'm here. Councilman Dunn? Here. Senior Councilman Goosby? Here. Councilman, Councilman Muscarella? Here. I would now ask our town clerk, Sylvia Cabana, to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Please stand. Hand over heart. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, Madam Clerk, you please call our first public hearing. One step forward. All right, before you call the public hearing, the student councilwoman would like to say a few words. Last week, we lost one of our heroes from the community of Unity. I'm sure that many of you will remember Mrs. Marie Patrice. Along with her husband, they attended many town board meetings and were very active in the community of Unity. I could always count on the Tatanese couple to appraise us on me of anything that was needed for the community of Unity. As a matter of fact, they were the first ones to walk me through the community and also to make sure that I knew where they wanted to have it. Union Dale Street State. They were very much involved in that. We have the Catholic pieces to thank for the founding of the Children's Farm House in Union Dale. I thank the Catholic pieces for their service and sacrifice, a sacrifice of time and energy. This husband and wife duo were almost the movers, always the movers and shakers of Union Dale United in total effort. We will miss her, and we really need to make sure that we never forget her husband. He was 92 years old when she passed, but they always went into the newspapers, and they would make sure, even though they could not see that well, they do whatever they could to magnify and send me more, anything that pertained to this town. So I did attend her mass. And we're going to miss them, and I think that we should really remember people who have given so much of themselves as they Thank you, Senior Councilwoman, for those words of remembrance. Uh, Madam Clerk, you please call up first public hearing. Proposed local law regarding regulations and restrictions to limit parking in North Belmore, Oceanside, near Rockville Center, Seaford, Uniondale, Wontaw, and Woodmere. I do not have any slips on this public hearing. Is there anyone who'd like to be heard? Hearing none, may I have a motion? Make a motion that we close the hearing and we will have a second. Madam Clerk? Supervisor Gillen? Aye. Councilman Gleeton? Aye. Aye. Councilman Diaz Casino? Aye. Councilman Dunn? Aye. Senior? Councilman Goosby? Aye. Councilman Muscarel? Aye. Madam Clerk, please call our next public hearing. The proposal of the law regarding parking or standing prohibitions in East Meadow, Elmont, Franklin Square, Hewlett, Lakeview, North Belmont, North Valley Street, Oceanside, Uniondale, and near Westbury. Uh, I have a slip from Susan Ryan. service. Um, there's just been so many uh, times over the last two years that um, I have gotten involved and come down here and learned about local government. I really want to thank you, Laura, for 
uh, shining a spotlight on a lot of different areas. You know, the town of Hempstead's a great place to live, but we can always be much better. There's, um, you know, been a hundred years of uh, one party system, and there's always a way. Ryan, yeah. I thank you so much for your remarks. But I've been pretty uniform and telling people they have to speak about okay. them on the calendar, so I'm so appreciative of your remarks. I do have to keep you to the public hearing. That would be great, and I also want to thank, and everybody else up there, just remember that there's many different changes. We can always be better, and we're going to be, you know, staying involved and uh, being part of it. We, we're a resource to you. So thank you, all of you. Thank you, Laura. Thank you, Sylvia. Thank you. I do not have any other slips on this public hearing. Is there anyone else who'd like to be heard? Very none, may I have a motion? I move the public hearing to be closed and the item to be adopted. Second. Madam Clerk. Supervisor Gillen? Aye. Councilman Blake? Aye. Councilman Diaz Fazito? Aye. Councilman Dunn? Aye. Senior Councilwoman Goosby? Aye. Councilman Mosgrove? Aye. Madam Clerk, please call the next public hearing. Proposed local law regarding arterial stops in Franklin Square, Garden City South, Inwood, Levitown, <coughs> and New York Westbury. I do not have any slips on this public hearing. Is there anyone who'd like to be heard? Hearing none, may I have a motion? Supervisor, I move that the public hearing be closed and the item adopted. Second. Madam Clerk? Supervisor Gillen? Aye. Councilman Blake? Aye. Councilman Diaz Pizzito? Aye. Councilman Dunn? Aye. Senior Councilwoman Goosby? Aye. Councilman Muscarello? Aye. Madam Clerk, please call the next public hearing. Proposed local law regarding traffic regulations in the vicinity of schools in Oceanside and Uniondale. I do not have any slips on this public hearing. Is there anyone who'd like to be heard? Hearing none, may I have a motion? I move that the public hearing be closed, the local law adopted. Second the motion. Madam Clerk? Supervisor Gillen? Aye. Councilman Blakeman? Aye. Councilman Diaz Fazito? Aye. Councilman Dunn? Aye. Senior Councilman Guzzi? Aye. Councilman Mosgrello? Aye. Madam Clerk, please call our next public hearing. Proposed local law regarding bus stops in East Meadow. I do not have any slips on this public hearing. Is there anyone who'd like to be heard? Hearing none, may I have a motion? I make a motion to close the hearing. I second. I second that motion. Madam Clerk? Supervisor Gillen? Aye. Councilman Blakeman? Aye. Councilman D'Esposito? Aye. Councilman Dunn? Aye. Senior Councilman Gisby? Aye. Councilman Mosgrove? Aye. Madam Clerk, please call the next public hearing. Proposed local law regarding U-turns prohibited in Baldwin. I do not have any slips on this public hearing. Is there anyone who'd like to be heard? Yeah. Okay, it's still morning. I was beginning to wonder what time this meeting got started. Um, <laughs> meet Jay Mary a Baldwin resident. Um, I will definitely be on topic by any support of, of this particular item because it will definitely provide um, safety for drivers um, who go down that particular route. It's a tricky configuration and unfortunately people do try to take advantage um, and we really need to make sure that we have this in place. So I am in support of this and I just hope that we can focus on additional safety measures as far as the roadways, but more importantly, if we could also make sure that the town does a better job fixing the roads themselves, because those potholes, as we're getting into the winter season, are only going to get worse, um, and that's all I'm going to say. Thank you. But I would note that, again, we're just hopeful that moving forward, the meetings, as far as time consideration for residents coming here, if the meeting is stated to start at 10.30, it should start at 10.30. Thank you. I agree. Thank you, Mr. Mary I do not have any other slips on this public hearing. Is there anyone else who'd like to be heard? Hearing none, may I have a motion? I move that the public hearing is closed and the item adopted. Second. Madam Clerk? Supervisor Gillen? Aye. Councilman Blakeman? Aye. Councilman Diaz Fazito? Aye. Councilman Dunn? Aye. Senior Councilman Goosby? Aye. Councilman Mosgrove? Aye. Madam Clerk, please call the next public hearing. Proposed local law regarding gross weight restrictions in Baldwin. I do not have any slips on this public hearing. Is there anyone who'd like to be heard? <coughs> hearing none, may I have a motion? 
I move that the public hearing be closed the local law adopted. Second the motion. Madam Clerk. Supervisor Gillen. Aye. Councilman Blakeman. Aye. Councilman D'Esposito. Aye. Councilman Dunn. Aye. Senior Councilwoman Goosby. Aye. Councilman Mosquera. Aye. Madam Clerk, please call our next public hearing. Proposed handicapped parking on public streets in Belrose Terrace, East Meadow, Elmont, Roosevelt, and West Hempstead. I do not have any slips on this public hearing. Is there anyone who would like to be heard? Hearing none, may I have a motion? I have a motion that it be closed and adopted. Second. Second the motion. Madam Clerk. Supervisor Gillen. Aye. Councilman Blakeman. Aye. Councilman Diaz Cicito. Aye. Councilman Dunn. Aye. Senior Councilwoman Goosby. Aye. Councilman Mosquerel. Aye. Madam Clerk, please call our next public hearing. Proposed handicapped parking on public streets in Elmont, Franklin Square, Near Limbrook, Roosevelt, Seaford, and Woodmere. I do not have any slips of this public hearing. Is there anyone who would like to be heard? Hearing none, may I have a motion? I move that the public hearing be closed and that the item be adopted. <laughs> Madam Clerk? Supervisor Gillen? Aye. Councilman Blakeman? Aye. Councilman D'Esposito? Aye. Councilman Dunn? Aye. Senior Councilwoman Goosby? Aye. Councilman Mosquerella? Aye. Madam Clerk, please call our next public hearing. Proposed revised public parking field maps in Wampa. I do not have any slips on this public hearing. Is there anyone who would like to be heard? Hearing none, may I have a motion? Motion to close the hearing and adopt. Second. Madam Clerk. Supervisor Gillen. Aye. Councilman Blakeman. Aye. Councilman D'Esposito. Aye. Councilman Dunn. Aye. Senior Councilwoman Goosby. Aye. Councilman Mosquerella. Aye. Madam Clerk, please call the next public hearing. Application of Ramator Mon Orange for a special exception public garage for use in an auto body repair shop business and outdoor storage for vehicles under repair, northeast corner of Babylon Turnpike and Jackson Avenue in Roosevelt. Good morning, Supervisor. <laughs> Town board members, uh, Christian Brown, Sonbor Kashinano, PLLC, 333, Earl Ovington Boulevard, Suite 601 Uniondale. I'm appearing for the applicant. Uh, the proprietor of the applicant is Edith McRae. Could you name on the record, please? Manage Ramakar. Manage Ramakar. Give your address, please. 2882 Flower Avenue, Ocean Street, New York, 11572. Right, this is an application uh, for a public garage use at 105. Babylon Turnpike in Roosevelt. Uh, the building uh, in which the use is proposed is in the industrial zone uh, located on the east side of Babylon Turnpike. <clears throat> it's along a corridor uh, that runs uh, from south to north on the east side of Babylon Turnpike that's improved with various commercial and industrial uses. Uh, in fact, the property <coughs> directly to the north of this is a uh, auto repair shop. Uh, behind it is an ice company, uh, and this uh, part of the building that's before you, as you can see, there's, if you look at the site plan there, uh, there are two tenant spaces in this building. My client would be the proposed tenant in the larger part of the building, the northerly part, which is 3,701 square feet, and there is an existing um, flooring company in the other part of the building that's about uh, uh, 1,150 square feet. Uh, the, prior to this, the, uh, the vacant area in which my client is proposing to put his auto repair business uh, was a shipping uh, type of operation, so there were trucks coming in and out of there. Uh, the property has, as I said, it's industrial property. It's long been used for these types of industrial and commercial uses. There are uh, COs on the property that go back to the 1960s, 1964, the property was given a CO for a light manufacturing use. So it's consistent with the history of the property. Um, slight correction to the application. This is not an auto body shop, it's an auto repair only. There will be no spray booth or other heavy type of work done here. It's simply car repairs. Uh, it's a small business. Mr. Ramatar is a town resident. He currently has his employment in Farmingdale. He's looking to move his business here to the town of Hempstead uh, to be closer to home and have his own, his own shop. He's been uh, a mechanic for about 20 years. 
in the business since he was a, a young person for almost 30 years. So this would give him an opportunity to run his own small business um, in Roosevelt in this industrial area. And again, there's no spray booth or anything of that nature. It would be repairs only. All the work will be done inside the premises. Any cars that need to be stored briefly overnight will be stored in the parking area. As you can see, there's an ample parking area um, that's directly adjacent to the building that will be enclosed with fencing. So there won't be any unsightly storage of cars uh, overnight. Uh, it's a small operation that will operate Monday through Friday, 9 to 5. It'll be closed on the weekends. There are two mechanics, himself and one other person, and one office staff. So only a total of three people will be on the premises. Uh, so that's really our application. I think it fits within the existing character of the area. Again, if you look up and down uh, Babylon Turnpike here, you'll see just to the south there are uh, just commercial stores, and then further south of that there are other auto repair shops and industrial warehouse type uses. Immediately to the north is an existing auto body repair shop. So this will fit in, won't change the fundamental nature and character of the area. It's a good use for the industrial zone. It will put a business into a large vacant space in Roosevelt, and it won't have any deleterious impact on the surrounding uh, uh, neighborhood as, again, this is an industrial area abutted by industrial property, and uh, all work will be done inside with minimal storage of cars in the enclosed parking area. So unless you have any questions, that's really our application. I have a question. Yes. Um, next to that building you're talking about, I know the ice company is there. Yes. And on the other side, is that a um, building where they have all those tires and so forth? Are you next to that building? Yes, ma'am. But that's and not your site. I know it's not his, but it's right next to it. It's and right It's such a small space, you know, there. And I'm looking at some photos here. I don't know if you've seen these or not. Uh, who can you listen to see this? Are you presently in that building? No, the, the, he is he is a, a tenant. He will be a tenant in the building if this is approved, with an option to purchase. Um, again, um, my client has followed all the rules, so he's not in there. He's not presently operating. Um, it's taken us about two years to get to this point, uh, and he still has a ways to go to get the permits and so forth. So he's very very anxious to get onto the site clean it up and rehabilitate it, at least to start the interior alterations, which we're hoping we'll be able to do after today. And then we'll work with the building department to deal with any issues related to parking. And I know that the building department had raised some concerns about whether this property itself was improperly subdivided off of the ICE company property many, many years ago. So I will work those issues through with the building department if this board sees fit to at least grant the use, and that would enable him to get into the site and begin cleaning it up and prepare to open. Well, there were neighbors around that area. Did you send out any letters to them to let them know what your proposals are? Yes, we, they were notified pursuant to the code. Are there any of those neighbors here? Did you see the neighbors out here? Oh, okay, good. All right, so I'd like to hear from them before I just do any more. Sure, okay, thank you. congested area, also a park is across the property, very, it, is, it will be very congested if there is another store coming up. Excuse me, I can understand you. It's a little bit slow. So what is your question? It is, it is already a congested area. Okay. Yeah. Congested, congested traffic. Area. Yeah, traffic okay. area. And also there is a park across from the property, which, which will, you know, if you add, add one more store or property, you will congest very badly. That is the reason I'm here representing them. Okay. 
Thank you, sir. Thank, Thank you. you. <coughs> Next, we have Calvert Joyce. Jones. Jones, sir. Calvert, C-A-L-B-E-R-T, Jones, uh, resident at 35 Lee Street in Roosevelt, uh, located there for 50 years in that one location. Uh, the reason I'm speaking of um, an, uh, Babylon Turnpike and near Centennial, I remember going back, there was a body shop there, and uh, it didn't do too good. It, it didn't maintain the place. The business there now keeps the place very clean, if you check with the police, the National County Police Department, there is a lot of accident right there on that corner. And there's a park right across the street. My son used to play there in that park. So concerned with traffic here, they would add a lot of uh, traffic because I, I goes up and down uh, Ballon Turnpike for many years. And I always see accident there on that corner because of the traffic there. Sometimes they run up in the parking lot of the um, Chinese place there, so Chinese restaurant there. And, and uh, there was a lot of accident there. And, and uh, okay. that's my decision. Yes. Thank you. Mr. Brown, do you have anything to add about the concerns about traffic? Uh, just that compared to what's been there in the past, this is a low intensity use unlike the ice company or the previous uh, delivery type of use. There won't be any trucks coming in and out of there. It's a low intensity. It only does car repairs. So it's not like a retail use where there's constant customer traffic coming in. It's a drop off, repairs are done and pick up. So it's not the kind of use that's gonna generate a lot of traffic. Everything will be done on the premises and inside. So it, it, it's not going, Compared to what other uses could go in there, it's an industrial building in an industrial area that's over 3,000 square feet. You could put almost any kind of use in there without having to come to this board because the industrial zone is so liberal. It's only because of a, the way that the Town of Hempstead Code is written that auto uses have to come to this board. But compared to, say, a trucking or a manufacturing operation, this is a very low intensity use. And those types of operations could go in there with no special permission. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I have a slip now from John F. Boyd, Sr. Morning, Town Board. Morning, morning. As you said, my name is John F. Boyd, Sr., and I'm located at 34 Lee Street, Roosevelt, New York, for 35 years. I'm the current president for the Roosevelt Chamber of Commerce, and um, we submitted a letter to the board stating our opposition for the board to approve this application for Mr. Remedar. Um, we're concerned about what Mr. Thomas said, the congested area. Roosevelt is really only one square mile, and we don't have a lot of space for um, all this types of different businesses that want to come in the community. We already have an auto repair shop not less than 100 feet from where this gentleman holds his auto repair shop. Um, I'm pro-business, and the people in the community are pro-business. However, if he were to be further down the block somewhere, it probably wouldn't be any problem. But right across the street from Centennial we'll Park, where we see kids play basketball and sport all day, even through the wintertime, summertime, and an eighth of a mile from Ulysses Fire School, we're concerned that it can create a traffic problem that might make it difficult for our young people and elderly people to get across the street, you know, to be able to, to fellowship with their friends and family and so on and so forth. So for the record, we just want to let you know that the Roosevelt Chamber of Commerce, um, who is the premier um, bipartisan um, organization in the community of Roosevelt, does not support this application. And we would strongly suggest that the town don't approve it. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, Glenda Herrera. Good morning. My name is Glenda Herrera. My address is 
office is 95 Avalon Town Pike in Brunsville. It's a business. I own the auto repair that it's in the Avalon Town Pike in the corner. It's an auto repair, the same as him. And actually, there is a little bit of traffic because of me. And there is a park. And I'm all over there too, and we're just a wall distance. It's not like there's a lot in between, it's a wall distance. And I, I'm here because I don't, I disagree with him being an older there as me, and it's really hard to make. So I'm here. Well, basically, are, are you objecting because it's competition? Well, yes, it's competition, but yeah, it's well, hard to say. I don't find that to be a very good argument. I will take care of this, uh, Councilman. I'm just waiting for no, I'm, I'm just commenting in general on any application that comes before us. When you come before this board and you have legitimate concerns, that's that's fine. But I do not consider competition to be a legitimate concern, wherever the application may be. I understand. I understand what she's saying. She's not saying it the right way. I will take care of it. He's going to be in front of me. He's just behind me. My clients can think his auto repair is going to be mine. Actually, my neighbors thought that I was going to expand. They came inside and they say, hey, Glenda, are you going to expand? I'm like, no, and it's just, uh, I don't know what's going on. And then I find out there's an auto repair that's going to be in my backyard. It's not like, you know, it's a lot between him and me. It's behind me. I'm okay if it's in front of me, or if there's a lot, or if there's a, a amount of feet in the but it's a wall. It's very high and there's a lot of people in my street. It's not just me, there is um, legal and there is a lot. I have visited, so I know it's not. Okay, thank you. Alan uh, Marina? Well, I suggest that you speak with the attorney while they're here, 
and try to work something out. They can try to move into your neighborhood if you want to be good neighbors. Right. So they'll try to make you be able to work and compromise with them. There is no space. Zero space. Zero space. You see, you see my trucks in the back then? You can't pour a truck in. Sir, I came over and I went through the whole place. I know what it looks like. I do. I do. Uh, yes, I have. I don't do anything until I come and look at it myself. So I know what you're talking about. And, and we do trust the uh, senior councilwoman who's the judgment and uh, it is her district. And she does a great job. So we're, we back her 100%. Thank you, sir. Uh, Audrey Little. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Audrey Little, 15 East Centennial Avenue, Side Street, Baton Turnpike. I just want to piggyback. My concern um, is the traffic congestion. As you know, it's very tight over there. Uh, my family has been in that neighborhood 67, 68 years. Okay. I've seen companies come and go. <laughs> we have an auto body shop right next door. And it's very tight. Sometimes we can't even park in front of our house. Um, noise impact, I'm concerned about that. Um, waking up, hearing, you know, it's right in the back of my house. So it's just, like I said, I'm just piggybacking. The traffic congestion, Babylon Turnpike, you have the buses, you have the school buses, you have the park. Um, and like the gentleman was saying, that owned the company. It's very tight. You can't even pull into. I, I just can't see you having, servicing one or two cars at one time. It, it, it just can't happen if you're going to have a business. I just see it being very congested and very tight. It's not going to work. Thank you. Have a good day. Thank you, ma'am. I do not have any other slips on this public hearing. Yes, ma'am. Good morning. Good morning. Lola Funderburg, 156 East Clinton Avenue, Roosevelt, New York. We should have a slip there because I did fill one out when I came in. Maybe I put the wrong title on it. But it, it anyway, um, Roosevelt is a very small community, one mile. And it seems to me, as I sit back there and listen, everybody can say what should be good for Roosevelt. Okay, I heard this gentleman says, oh, the business is good. You know, we know what we, what's good for our community. And if this man is coming, and he's only going to travel, have service two or three cars, we all know that's for a lot of people, okay? And we also know that if he's looking to expand his business, he's certainly coming to Roosevelt, he's going to service more than one or two cars because it's not even worth his time to be in business to serve one or two cars. Right. And on that corner, there's a park. And all our kids go there and play basketball. That's where they have their tournaments and everything. And we've had a lot of accidents on that corner. And if you travel down Babylon Turnpike, you can see we don't need anything else like that on Babylon Turnpike. What we are trying to do is build our community up. Even on Nassau Road, everywhere you look, we got wood yards. I mean, that is out downtown, you know, and it looks worse than Babylon Turnpike. And I'm not against the gentleman doing business. He has a business, and he should stay in Farmingdale. And if you don't want to stay in Farmingdale, then he need to find a place that's compatible for him and where the community will welcome him. Because we are not welcoming him there. Because there's not enough room there. Our children will not be safe there. And we know what we need in our community. And we certainly do not need another car repair. We know when people start bringing cars, you cannot control how many people are coming to get their car repaired on any day. So that's a lot of bull that his attorney keeps saying. Okay, and please don't think that we lying around and we sleep and we don't see and we don't know what's going on because we do. I live a few blocks from there, but believe me, I'm up all time of night driving and looking to see what's going on in my community because I've been there over 50 years. And that is a bad corner for, for this board to approve a, a car place or anything like that where our children have to travel and play basketball and enjoy themselves across from the park. Thank you.
Thank you. Is there anyone else who'd like to be heard on this public hearing? May I just make a closing remark? We have a lady coming. Good morning. Good morning, Anne. My name is Joanne Sanders. I'm a resident and homeowner at 17 East Centennial <coughs> Avenue. I've been there for 40 years. I'm strongly opposed to this. As, as a resident, there's definitely too much congestion in the area. There are too many vehicles to me access on the corner. I may be repeating what has been said, but I need to be heard. As a homeowner, as it stands right now, if I were to leave my home and go to a doctor's apartment, half the time I cannot even park in front of my house. If you come down to East Centennial, you will see there's cones in front of the homes because if we leave out, there's nowhere to park. All right? I had a back surgery and I had to leave several times a week to go back and forth to doctors. I had to put cones out to ensure that I had a place to park, that I could maneuver myself to get back indoors. All right? My bad will turn right, there's school. There's uh, Washington Road School. The kids walk to schools. That's a crossing guard right there on that corner. A bad will turn pike and uh, East Centennial. I mean, if there's the cars are parked everywhere that you can barely get the kids across the street. If I were to leave and come down back in time to turn by going uh, north, in order for me to turn down East Centennial, I have to make a wide turn to get into the street because there's so much congestion on that corner itself. On that corner, even like even on a Sunday, I come home from church, I can barely get down the street. Something we cannot let this be approved. It is not right. We're homeowners, we cherish our homes, we take care of our homes. As I said, I've been in the area 40 years, and quite frankly, I'm really tired of how everything's just dumped on us as if we're not real people. We're people, we're homeowners, and we do care about our property. I'm begging the board to please not approve this. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Is there anyone else who'd like to be heard on this public hearing? Okay. Rita Jane Marinet. Well, I'm living in Baltimore when I was born and raised in Roosevelt. Um, I was one of those young people who had to walk um, in that direction. Um, my family was involved in making sure that we had some zoning that would bring businesses into that community. And my concern for those who are not familiar with that area, I mean, you can stretch your limbs in any direction and you will hit an auto body repair workshop, body shop, a paint shop in that community and it is detrimental to the ongoing or we would like to see some type of economic development when you have to read a news day about the empty lots that are along Nassau Road which is the major thoroughfare in Roosevelt being empty when you see buildings going up like overnight in other communities I would love to see the number of auto body shops that are bumper to bumper, neck to neck, that line down the turnpike, maybe along Franklin Avenue in Garden City. Now what would the residents say in Garden City if they had to deal with that on a regular basis with the exhaust? Even in the pictures here, you see cars that are legally parked on Bellman because there's no place to park. So how would you like to be able to come home and have cars that are parked overnight in front of your house? So if you're going to give consideration, and don't give these residents the false hope that you may table it today, and there's another meeting, and then it comes back, and there's nobody here to speak against it, that you pass it. So I'm just hopeful that those residents that are here today, and I am grateful for the fact that Senior Councilwoman Goosby is definitely going to be on this situation, because it's not going to be beneficial. That park was designed for industrial and commercial to generate jobs and to also enhance the overall atmosphere and ambiance of the community. <laughs> Roosevelt may be a square mile, but those of us who are from Roosevelt are proud of it and want to continue to see it grow because it was a thriving and vital community. And for me, it was a great place to grow up and I want it to be a great place for those young people, those young homeowners and those seniors, those residents, and I know a number of residents who had accidents right in that area because it is very difficult to get around when you have the trucks and deliveries and park trucks and things of that nature. So again, let's be mindful that there are hardworking taxpayers 
who also live in Roosevelt. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Linda. Mr. Brown, do you want to get close to one? Very briefly to leave you with these thoughts. Uh, again, this is a light manufacturing district. I think the testimony from the residents establishes the character of the area up and down Babylon Turnpike. Uh, I think the, really the analysis with these types of applications is whether they fit into the character of the area and, when, and, and how they fit compared to other things that could be done by right. So if people are concerned about traffic and the park and so forth, consider what could go in this 3,100 square feet without having to come to this board. 24-hour manufacturing, warehouse, industrial type uses. By right, this is a two-person mechanic shop. All right? So when you compare the intensity of what could go there by right against this application, I think it's amongst the, the lowest intensity type uses you could find in a, uh, a building of this size in this zoning district. And it will only operate Monday to Friday during business hours. It's not a 24-hour operation. There's not going to be anybody there over the weekend. There aren't trucks coming in and out with deliveries. There's not fumes or other noise generated by manufacturing products. So I, I would ask the board to look at it from, from that perspective because the owner of the property obviously has a right to use it and use it consistent with the zoning. And the question is whether this particular use is a better use, a more um, favorable use to the surrounding neighborhood because of its low intensity and because the board has some control and can impose covenants to make sure that what we're presenting here today is what actually goes on. Instead of allowing a manufacturing use to come in with trucks and noise and so forth over which this board would have no control. So to the extent that people are also concerned about the unsightliness of it and the Chamber of Commerce doesn't want this building to be cleaned up, there's nobody in the place. It's 3,100 square feet of vacant space in Roosevelt where we could have a productive business. And a final point. It takes almost two years for someone who wants to open a mechanic shop to get before this board. That's a long time to keep somebody in limbo. Most of the people who come here are already operating. This gentleman is not. He waited and went through the process. Not saying that entitles him to a grant. But I would just ask the board to think about going into the next term, whether the process for these types of small auto repair and auto body shops is a sensible one, or whether it could, people could get here faster and get an answer. So I would leave you with that. And thank you. All right. All right. Uh, I do not have any other slips on this public hearing. May I have a motion? My motion is thank you all for coming, especially the Roosevelt um, community. Thank you so much for coming because this is your community. And my motion is to close the application and reserve decision. Second. Madam Clerk. Supervisor Gillen. Aye. Councilman Blakeman. Aye. Councilman D'Esposito. Aye. Councilman Dunn. Aye. Senior Councilwoman Guzdi. Aye. Councilman Mosgrove. Aye. Madam Clerk, please call the next public hearing. Application of tax. I'd like to say something to the uh, uh, residents. Thank you for coming, and I thank you for reminding everyone that Roosevelt is only one square mile. So we do not have a lot of property in Roosevelt that needs to be sold. There are two small pieces of property on Nassau Road that are not really applicable for what people want to do. So I hope anyone who wants to come to Roosevelt, as long as I'm a senior councilwoman, make sure you come right. And make sure the residents are involved because that's where they live. We are one square mile. There's not a lot of property in Roosevelt to be sold which I saw in news day so many times, and other people think that it's there, but it's not. So, forget it. Thank you. All right. <laughs> Madam Clerk, we'll call our next public hearing, please. Application of Pathland Holdings, LLC, for a permit to include existing gasoline service station with GSS district and demolish the existing one-story building with basement and construct a new one-story, 2,996-foot convenience store without basement and with eight multiple product dispensers providing 16 fueling stations, additional site work for 
parking approximately 33,572 feet of landscaping and a trash enclosure are also proposed. No automotive repairs, bodywork, automotive painting, or automotive sales will occur. East South Side of Pixel Road and South South Side of Central Avenue in Denver. Good morning, Supervisor Killen, members of the board, William Vanessa, for Shelley Deacon Tarana, 333 Earl Ovington Boulevard, Uniondale, New York, here on behalf of the applicant, Pathland Holdings. Good morning. Uh, LLC, rather. Um, the applicant is the owner of a parcel of property situated on the east side of Hicksville Road in the Hempstead portion of Bethpage, just south of the convergence of North Wantra Avenue and Hicksville Road. Uh, presently, the property is developed with a closed bank building that had a drive-through building associated with it as well. And as noted, the proposal here is to convert the property, uh, redevelop the property entirely for the introduction of a 7-Eleven guest and service station and convenience market on the site. Uh, we have handed up uh, handouts that will allow the board to follow along in the presentation. Also, we've provided the board with copies of the traffic and parking study that was performed by our engineering firm. And we'll be getting to the testimony of our real estate expert and traffic expert in just a few minutes. But just to give you an introduction to the application, I would first point out that this is an extremely large parcel of property situated in the business X district on the east side of uh, Hicksville Road. Uh, the property is entirely zoned Business X District. It is over, over 330 feet deep. Um, it maintains uh, present uh, curb cuts on Hicksville Road as well as Central Park on its north side. There's a driveway that runs behind the building on the corner of Hicksville Road and Central Park. That curb cut is presently there. The proposed development represents a what, what we feel is a very good use of the property. It is one which will provide for uh, a very low building coverage, a very low intensity other than up on the front of the property at the Hicksville Road side of the property where the fueling stations, the eight pumps and 16 fueling stations are proposed to be. Uh, there is, as noted by the uh, the town clerk, over 33,000 square feet of landscaping on this property, over three quarters of an acre of landscaping on this property. This is an area, this property that would be significantly green, significantly landscaped. It would be an attractive site. The convenience market itself is only 3,000 square feet, just under 2,996. Um, it has more than the required parking. Mr. Vanessa, can I just interrupt you for a moment? With the landscaping, are you talking about the landscaping that's already existing on the property? No. Or that you're going to add to the property? Yes, right okay. now behind the, behind the bank is a large parking lot. That is going to be totally redeveloped. If you take a look at the, uh, I guess it's the fourth page in. You can see a page that's listed as subject site, key dimensions, and proposed setbacks. You can see the, there is uh, a large green area proposed in the rear of the property adjacent to the residences to the east. There is fencing proposed there. So that's what's right next to you, all, the, all yes. those nice little green right. trees. Correct. Thank you. Yes, my client went to the trouble of making a, a model uh, for the board's review and consideration. There will be six foot high PVC fencing running the entire easterly property line adjacent to the residential properties to the east. There'll be significant landscaping there, and then there'll be that very large grass area that separates the, the residents to the east from the, even the beginning of the, the parking area uh, situated to the west. There is 117.8 feet to the back of the building. There is 215 feet to the closest part of the canopy, and over 220 feet to the closest uh, fueling pump. So this is a large site developed in such a way as to keep all of the activity forward on Hicksville uh, Road and away from the residents to the east. The parking, as I uh, began to indicate, is more than what's required. 
for a 7-Eleven of this size, we are providing 33 parking spaces, whereas Uh, excuse me, 32 parking spaces where I was only 15 uh, spaces are required. And just again, to reiterate the size of this property, we have here uh, a, 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 almost two acres of property that will only be for this gas station convenience market. As you'll hear from Mr. Nelson, our real estate expert, this property being as large as it is, as it is could either be subdivided and developed with multiple commercial uses all as of right, or it could be done without subdivision. There could be multiple uses put on this property all at once, which would significantly, uh, we think, increase the intensity and significantly impact the neighbors in a much greater way than this application will. Now, uh, we recognize that 7-Eleven is a 24-hour operation. That's true. But again, 7-Eleven could go on this site, again, as of right. That's not the issue, that's not the reason we're before this board. We're three for this board simply asking for the right to have gasoline service with the 7-Eleven. And because we're keeping the gasoline service all the way up on Hickville Road, it'll be serviced, uh, it'll, it'll be serviced from there, or we, my client will agree to covenants that require all fuel deliveries, all deliveries to the 7-Eleven store, and all sanitation pickup to come from Hicksville Road not utilize the Central uh, Avenue access point. He was willing to landscape significantly, even more than what he's shown, if the neighbors have an inclination to put higher walls, sound walls, sound attenuation. We've, we've made uh, indications to the neighbors who have contacted us about that, that we're prepared to do those things. Put sound baffling as needed on the 7-Eleven HVAC systems, whatever the case may be, in order to address their concerns. So. With that introduction, if I may, I'd like to call uh, Mr. Nelson. Unless Mr. Dunn, do you have a question? I'm sorry, Councilman Dunn. Yeah, there's been quite a few uh, calls and concerns from the neighbors. So you're saying you spoke to neighbors, but was there a, uh, um, an effort put forth to have the neighbors come in and discuss what's going there? Or did you go to the Board of Zoning Appeals if you need to do that? We do not need to go to the Board of Zoning Appeals. We sent, we sent letters with the notice of the, uh, of the hearing advising that if anyone had questions, they could call us. This year? Yes, oh, this year, yes. You've not met with them yet? Pardon? Yeah. No, we have not met with the neighbors. I have spoken to three neighbors who have contacted me. We advised that if they wanted to get together and if they wanted to come in and see the plan, we would be happy to do that. There was no indication that, that they wanted to do that. I've been advised by the local assemblyman that his concerns are the gas station and that there's a, a 60 so a petition signed by 60 of the neighbors that are concerned about the gas station also. So I, uh, I'm really interested in hearing everything you have to say. And, uh, anybody here from Alice hearing? From, uh, yeah. They have plenty of people here. Okay. So uh, I'm glad to hear to discuss this. Tell them what is going on. Um, if there's anything that can be done, you know, to talk to them to make any kind of compromise if there is anything like that available. That would be great because there's a room right back there with the glass. You see, we can sit with them and talk to them. But um, I, I, this, you did an awful lot of planning, and it really, I think you should have talked to them a little earlier to see what their, their pros and cons were. Um, but I, I'd like to hear exactly what's going on with that bank building. Is that going to be this, this demolished? Yes. The bank building is completely, is, is going to be removed. There is presently a 7-Eleven on on the Street Road and North Wontaw Avenue on a small site, a tight site. Uh, that is going to be closed. That, that is a 7-Eleven uh, owned site. It's not a leased site. They are going to market that property for sale for commercial use. They would obviously put a, a restriction on it that it not be a convenience market or a, a gas station if this was to be approved. The idea is to locate, is to relocate the 7-Eleven from that side to this side with the gas. Another concern was the uh, right next door is the Winter University. They do dialysis there, primary care. Is your parking going to be uh, disrupting that at all? Or? Not in any way, shape, or form. Our, we, as indicated, 
our site requires 15 parking spaces. We're going to have 33, 32 parking spaces on site. So we have more than ample parking for our use. So I used to drive mom there when she was alive to do a primary care in that facility. And the park was really tight then. Uh, so it won't be it won't be affected by our parking. In fact, I would say that this site, being being that we'll have more than the required parking for the 7-Eleven, it would relieve some uh, whatever overflow parking may be occurring on that property. Well, I'm not going to interrupt any more of your presentation so the neighbors can hear exactly what you're doing, and then they can come up and voice their questions and their opinions, and uh, we all can listen to you. Thank you. If I may, I'd like to have Mr. Nelson, Barry Nelson, who's here. He's a recognized real estate expert, recognized by this board, and permitted to give opinion testimony as to property values as to, to the impact on the character of the neighborhood. I would ask that he be permitted to provide an opinion testimony in that fashion. Uh, good morning. Good morning, Mr. Nelson. Good morning. Uh, it's Barry Nelson, 220, Pennsylvania, <coughs> Belmont, New York, 11710. I did hand in, in, in a packet of photographs that include the subject property, its uh, development currently, and the surrounding uses that would be found on Hicksville Road, Longshore Avenue, Central Park Avenue, also known as Central Avenue, as well as the residential along uh, Monofish Court and Lynn Place, as well as Edward Street, which are the residential streets in the vicinity of the subject property. I've been practicing probably over 35 years in the Porter's Board many times. I'm just going to ask whoever is chatting in the gallery if you could please just keep it down. We're having a hard time hearing Mr. Nelson. Oh, I'm sorry. I'll speak up. It is one of the largest sites for a GSS overlay district that I've worked on, as I mentioned, probably in 35 years. As Council mentioned, it's almost two acres, 86,000 square feet. It is currently improved with a bank facility that's been closed for several years. Substantially, the entire parcel is asphalt paved with some landscaping on the, in the front and some in the rear where it meets the residential community, which would be Monica Court and Lynn Place. The uses will find Montreux Avenue, north and south, Hicksville Road, north and south on Main Ontario Roads, and Central Park Avenue, east and west. Those uses that you'll find along those Ontario roads would be professional services, retail, restaurants, there are a numerous auto repairs, and in close proximity to some uh, site, there's another uh, gasoline with a C store, and there are other gas stations north and south. Typically, you'll find gas stations are <coughs> corner sites, interior sites, on parcels that are approximately 100 feet, maybe a little bit greater in depth, and most of the time are adjacent to residential community. This site meets and exceeds all the minimum requirements for the GSS uh, zone. I've read the code numerous times before coming today. I've read it over the years since it was introduced back in the late 70s, early 80s, I think it was. And many times, the sites are tight. They don't provide the landscaping to mitigate any impacts of residential and the commercial. Before we even get into this, if the site is proposed to have almost 40% of the site landscaped, over 30,000 square feet. The majority of the landscaping would be in the rear where it's abutting the residential. Uniquely, I think uh, Councilman Dunn brought up the, what would be the impact to the medical use, which would be to the north and to the south. And if you look at the uh, renderings and the exhibits that have been prepared, and this is unique to most stations that uh, come before this board for a GSS, where they're providing 20-foot landscape on the northerly side and the southerly side where it meets the commercial developments. Usually you find some fencing and parking right up to the property line. But you'll see that there's <coughs> landscaping of at least 20 feet both on the north side and the south side, and that's a minimum of 20 feet. 
I looked at, uh, and before I get into what I look at, of similar developments, what you have is almost the last, one of the last pages of the exhibit that was handed in earlier by council, and that's an as-of-right development scenario for this parcel. Again, it's over 86,000 square feet entirely within a business district. And some of the uses that were brought up or noted on that ex uh, exhibit would be alternative uses to the site. Currently, this site now has real estate taxes over $110,000 with 70% uh, of it to the school districts. There's a substantial burden on that. Those taxes would not go away. Why I say that, I looked at a similar development on Grand Avenue between Sunrise Highway and Merrick Road. A similar development as proposed to today's application on, I think it's approximately 22 to 23,000 square feet. Same size convenience store, approximately 3,000 square feet as proposed. Slightly smaller canopy and um, I think it's two islands and four double pump dispensers. That station itself, location with the sea store, has real estate taxes over $105,000. So with this development, it's going to be similar or greater than what's already being, uh, what's already existed. The, in fact, let's go back to that location that I just uh, mentioned. It's adjacent to business, there's some medical uses, it's opposite a religious institution, there's multi-family, single families on Edna Court, and uh, I forget the street to the south. Uh, nevertheless, it's a parcel that runs from street to street and is on the west side of Grand Avenue. Similar type of development, what's proposed on one, probably one third the size of what's being proposed today. 86,000 square feet, same convenience store, slightly uh, increase on the pump islands. Those pump islands, as council mentioned, is over, the nearest to the canopy is over 215 feet to the rear property line. With that said, the GSS requires a parcel to be 100 feet in depth. So the proximity to the canopy is double the minimum requirements of the GSS zone. The C store would be placed, or the convenience store would be placed in the middle, mitigating any impacts to the residential to the east, and you'll have at least 30 plus feet from the paved area to the property line that'll be landscaped. I looked at twofold. You have numerous locations with gas stations are adjacent to residential, and you'll find them on Main Ontario Road, on Secondary Road, so the Secondary Road we consider the Central Park Avenue, Hicksville Road, Wanter Avenue. I looked at, and this board has entertained many applications by competitors on smaller sites where they're adjacent to residential. I looked at just convenience stores, and convenience stores on this side is a matter of right, where they've located in business districts next to resident, backing up to residential on Merrick Avenue in Merrick, in East Meadow, on corners, with similar size and slightly larger convenience stores open 24 hours. On the, app, uh, on the exhibit that the attorney and the council handed in, you'll see the alternative uses. And these are just several items. You can put a 21,000 plus square foot two-story mixed-use building up front. When I say mixed-use, you can have retail on the first floor, offices on the second floor, still include a C-store, convenience store of a 7-Eleven, with deli takeout, a Chinese takeout, offices on the second floor, 100 plus parking spaces, and that would be almost up to the rear property line, maybe a 10 foot setback as it exists today. Easily this site can accommodate a 10,000 square foot typical 
restaurants such as like Friday, TGIF Fridays, Hands and Outback Steakhouse, Steakhouse, and with 10,000 square feet, they normally have approximately 250 seats with a bar interior. So that would, this site can easily accommodate a use like that. Can easily accommodate a pharmacy on a modest size of approximately 14,000 plus square feet that could be open up 24 hours with a drive-through for the uh, for the medications. And it could also, we have own cone type of operations that are opening up throughout many locations and they're open almost seven days a week, late hours, early in the morning, which would increase substantially the amount of activity to the site. Getting back to... So let me see if I heard that correct. The deliveries are going to be done during daylight, uh, during daytime. I didn't mention it. Is that what you're talking about? No, 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 no. A pharmacy. Okay. 24-hour operation right in CVS Walgreens, they can have a drive-through and be open 24 hours a day. That'd be great, but my, my, one of my concerns, one of the things that uh, has brought to my attention is uh, the big gas trucks coming at night, the delivery and the, the, and the convenience store, uh, foods coming at night, we, 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 can, the day. we can control that, uh, Councilman Dunn. We, we can put covenants in the We can put covenants and limita limitations on delivery times for inventory, on delivery times for fuel, and on sanitation pickup. We will be using private sanitation. So we can put limitations on that to make sure that it's not occurring in the dead of the night. Okay. And then, you know, uh, it wasn't mentioned even I didn't hear it, um, that you are right in the little Levittown, I have the trees, Beth Page, Hicksville, very patriotic area. Um, the men and women coming home that are serving right now, they love seeing the American flag flying from and you have a uh, uh, mild display flag all proposed. Right, that, that's always a concern of mine, I'm sure. Yes, it will be on the uh, Continue, I'm sorry to interrupt. Sorry. Okay. sorry for uh, uh, And now uh, I'll start to finish up in my conclusion. So I believe it's a compatible <coughs> use with the commercial development along Hicksville Road and Central Park Avenue. Mm -hmm. The concern would be to mitigate any possible impacts to the residential, the single family homes that are well made maintained on Monica Court and Lynn Place. And that's where the developer has taken in the astute development of this parcel with over 40 plus feet of landscaping, moving the drive aisles and the parking away from the residential, providing for new fencing and double layer of within at least 10 feet of the property line of screening that will mature and it hide any of the visual impacts that the residential might have. Those other locations that I've mentioned, I looked at the property values, and some of them were developed within the last 10 to 15 years, especially the C stores, convenience stores, 7-Elevens, as well as gas stations, and what they would do to the trends going forward. The subject site was developed in around the 1963s, 60s, early 60s. The Monica Court, I believe, was developed in a similar time frame. No, they were developed afterwards in the middle to late 70s, up until uh, around the 1980s. As far as Lynn, Lynn Place, they were developed in, after the commercial was developed on St. Hicksville Road in the 60s. You have Edward Street to the south, they were built in the late 40s and the early 50s. Property values have continued to appreciate and will continue to appreciate regardless of whether this site is developed or not <coughs> as the trend goes. So I looked at other locations that were developed and by, the, by competitors, Mobile, Exxon, Polar, how property values were reflected in those instances and they were, most of them in the town of Hampton, some who were nearby in the town of Oyster Bay. They appreciated the residential, appreciated consistent with the trends for that time frame in those areas. So what I'm saying is if values appreciated 3%, 5%, those homes that were near and abutted commercial and CBS, I mean, um, C stores and gas stations appreciated at the same rate. 
Granted, the impact of the commercial already exists in this area. It's my opinion, this proposed development is not going to be more deleterious, more of a negative impact than what is a as of right development for the site. Again, the code requires 15,000 square feet. The applicant is proposing over 30,000 square feet of landscaping on the site. 40% of the site will be landscaped, fenced, to mitigate any impact of commercial and special residential. Yeah, that's, um, we have quite a few people uh, waiting for quite a while to, to have questions. I only have two more concerns that uh, somebody from McEwen and, and myself have thought about is, uh, and one of them was the, it's not going to affect the school tax at all. It's not going to diminish the amount of money you pay for the school tax where the residents are to pay more. No, it's not going to probably be greater. Uh, we'll take more time. Okay, that's one. And the other thing, the most important thing, uh, that first thing that came to my mind when you said gas station there, was the United States Navy had been on that park in that, that area for many, many, many years. And there's a plume. And the, this, the fear of putting a gas station anywhere in that area where the plume is already existing, uh, can you give us something that's going to make us hang on a hat? Say all right, we're okay. Is this up to the, the, the state of the art um, tanks? Is it uh, going to be special? You know, tell us about how you're going to help us not increase the pool. Councilman, I, we took that into consideration. A number of the neighbors had mentioned that when I spoke to them. First of all, this will be state of the art development. These will be. Uh, double wall fiberglass tanks which have the, the leakage alarms in them. There's a, they, they are immediately uh, notified if by some chance a tank should, should fail. Um, all installation uh, is overseen by New York State DEC, by local uh, fire marshal's office. Everything that, needs, that is required will be done to the, to the highest level. Now, with regard to the plume, we spoke to Environmental Council, one of my, one of my partners in the office is an environmental attorney who's been working uh, uh, on, on the Grumman properties. Uh, and he advised that in this area, there, there is certainly, but that is hundreds of feet below, below ground. This site, when it's excavated, will go, come nowhere near the, the contaminated areas where the, where the groundwater contamination is. This excavation, there's no basement on this building. The tanks will be sunk, but they're not going to be, they're not going to be sunk to, the, to anywhere close to uh, uh, affecting the plume area in any way, shape, or form. So when this is installed, it'll have no impact whatsoever on the plume. Additionally, if there are concerns, my client would be prepared to create, because the concern about contamination when you open the ground is vapor, so uh, vapor leakage. My client is prepared to put a, a vapor barrier system when he constructs his building to make sure that there's no vapors that can escape from the property. And he put venting in there. If it, if it turned out he needed to make it an active system, he would make it an active system. And we would put all that in the restricted covenants. Okay, so I was, I was kind of glad to hear that the back of the settlement of the building is at least 39 yards, which is wider than a football field from the fence. It's 117 feet from the fence. That's the closest part of the building. Roughly 30, roughly the width of a, and a bench, a football field with the benches. Correct. So it, it, it is far enough away, but the, uh, yeah. <clears throat> now, but you said the tanks have a system where if there is a crack or a leak, an alarm will go off and they'll be able to, to stop it immediately and get the uh, um, my next witness is, is Mr. Chuck Olivo. He's with our engineering firm. I'm going to have him speak to that more directly. Okay, and then, and then we'll hear from the yeah, sir. in terms of the people. Sure. <clears throat> oh, Before Mrs. Wilson, I'd like to complete my, my uh, look, finish the application. Yeah, yeah, finish the application, and then we'll have to speak. Uh, Chris, oh, they may answer your questions, sir. Sure. That, that, that really are very concerned. Before Mr. <laughs> Mr. Nelson goes, I just want to touch upon one point that, that he said and, and make sure that I got it correctly. So, Mr. Nelson, based upon your review of this application, based upon your review of the uses that could go on the property as of right, the, those four scenarios that you gave, which are only four of many uh, uses that could go on the site, I believe you said, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe you said that it is your expert opinion that 
if the site is developed as proposed with these setbacks, with this landscaping, with this amount of, land, uh, uh, with this amount of green space, and with the positioning of the building, if it's developed as we've proposed, it will have no greater effect, negative or positive, on the neighboring residential property values than would a development of the property with the as of uses. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Thank you very much. Are you next with this thing? I'd like to call Mr. Charles Olivo. Uh, Mr. Olivo is with Bridge Engineering. That is our engineering firm. He's also a uh, um, transportation engineer who's been qualified by this board in the past to provide expert testimony in traffic and parking. We would ask that he be permitted to speak in that regard uh, here today. Before you get to your uh, direct presentation, Let's just talk about the, the types of safety measures that go into the facility that we're talking about. Absolutely. Good afternoon, Madam Supervisor, members of the board, members of the public. Just for the record, my name is Charles Olivo from Stanford <coughs> Engineering and Design. We are the civil engineering firm and traffic engineering firm that have prepared the documents that have been submitted for the board's review. As Project Council has spoken about, in terms of the underground storage tanks that would be installed as part of the gasoline and fueling service, this is a state-of-the-art monitoring system in accordance with all modern standards and in many ways exceeds the Department of Environmental Protection standards as it relates to the monitoring that is required. It's 24 hours a day, seven days a week, monitoring at the station itself and at the convenience store and should there be, these are double wall tanks, should there be any type of disruption within the layers between the tank itself or on the outside of the tank, there is the ability to completely shut off the facility and inspect it at that time. In addition to that, there are annual third party inspections that are conducted each year, maintenance logs that are kept for the purposes of making sure that the equipment continues to be up to standards. Mr. Olivo, in terms of fueling, in terms of putting the gas into the tanks, what's the process there and what type of, are, are, are fumes released when the gas is put into the storage tanks? This system, when a fuel truck comes to the site to deliver, which is on an as-needed basis, and this is close to the Hicksville Road frontage where the underground storage tanks are located, but there is a procedure, there's training that's involved when a fuel delivery truck comes to the site, it essentially locks into the underground tank system, the truck is turned off, and then the fuel is unloaded from the fuel tank into the system itself. Now in accordance with environmental protection standards, there's also a vent system that is located proximate to the state highway system well elevated off the ground, also in accordance with environmental standards. And during that time, the pressure system within the tank, as you have air or an empty system and you're inserting fuel into the tank, there is a release of pressure and potential, whatever type of system is in there is released through the vent system, but we're, we're not having vapor leave the system. In fact, you're recovering that vapor and utilizing it within the tank system itself. And just to note, again, on the page that shows subject site key dimensions and proposed setbacks, those storage tanks would be approximately 220 feet away from the residence systems to the east. Is that correct? That is correct, yes. I would like to you on this by day. Um, the trucks that deliver the, uh, the fuel, they are going to deliver it and they're going to have to put that, that covenants in there. But now if they come at 3 o'clock in the morning and they're diesel trucks, they're going to wait until daytime to, to put the oil or gas rather into the, into the tanks. That noise will keep the neighbors awake. If there's a way with them, they'll be outside the area before they come to the site to do the deliveries. Because uh, whether it be the fuel, uh, I just don't want to have any complaints later that 
You should have asked this. It's, it's not expected that the vehicles will, will come. If, if the vehicles are being directed and controlled in terms of when the deliveries occur, it's not expected that they'll come overnight and sit there and wait to fuel. That wouldn't be efficient for, for the company. They would come during the day and do their service then. But even if a truck had, if, if an extraordinary situation occurred and a truck came too early before the, the permitted time for fueling, it would come on the it could come on the property. It could sit in the front of the property next to Hitchfield Road, turn off its engine. There would be no noise. There would be no activity. There would be nothing that would affect the neighbors that which who, who would be over 250 feet away. If in fact it did happen and uh, the neighbors do make them aware that it's going to get kept away at night, even from the air conditioning services up top, sometimes up like that. Uh, I haven't had that complaint with with 7-Eleven, but from other. Uh, companies I have, but uh, maybe an agreement with the Sears parking lot so they can wait there till the morning, till daylight, then they can come and deliver. So we know that they won't be disturbed at night. We can certainly look into that, Council. Okay, thank but, you. I, but I would also remind the Council of what Mr. Nelson said. This property could be de developed with as of right uses, which would put Commercial building. You want to be native friendly. I, no, I understand. I understand that. what you're saying. Oh, okay. I understand that. Understand that. Commercial <laughs> building could put very close to the residential property lines. Vehicles could be coming in, delivering overnight at any time, whatever time they wanted to. This development will prohibit all of that. It will prevent all of that type of activity that the neighbors would be potentially put out by. Right, please finish, and, and then we can have it. We can hear from the residents. Now you can provide your, your uh, general narrative testimony, please. Absolutely. Well, you've heard from Project Council, Mr. Nelson, as well. It's a very well designed, well planned site as it relates to balancing building areas, areas of circulation, and parking, and in addition to that, a very strong green buffer area, landscape area provided that completely wraps around the site. In terms of the accessibility to the site, under existing conditions, there are two driveways along Hicksville Road, and that road is under the jurisdiction of the Department of Transportation. This is a state highway that pumps and moves a lot of the traffic volume through this roadway network on the order of about 33,000 on a daily basis, 33,000 vehicle trips that traverse this roadway section today. What is being proposed as part of the access to the redevelopment of this site would be a driveway that would be located to the northerly extent of the property, which would be right in, right out access only. So similar to what you have today, but consolidated and pushed to the north as far as we can with adequate spacing to the property to the north as well. In addition to that, we would be maintaining the access point to Central Avenue. Access would be provided there. Central Avenue carries approximately 19,000 vehicles on a daily basis. So in terms of traffic mobility, we understand that this is a critical intersection where we are located. One of the things that I would mention just for a broader context is that the 7-Eleven is located at one farm edge, which is only about 350 feet away from the site to the southwest, would be relocated to this site. So that 7-Eleven would be removed and relocated here in terms of the convenience operation. That was one of the concerns. Yes, and, and so some of that traffic associated with that site, obviously, people are not strangers to the 7-Eleven brand along this corridor, would likely be directed or redirected to this subject property as a result of this redevelopment of the site. What studies show from a traffic perspective is this type of use, which is now becoming more of a development trend that I'm sure the board is familiar with, which is integrated convenience. And what I mean by that is the convenience of the store itself, just under 3,000 square feet, combined with gasoline fueling. I would call, saying that this is a gas station, I, I would call somewhat of a misnomer in that typical gas stations have other automobile services associated with them, hydraulic lifts, you have a number of cars parked for long-term purposes throughout the site that are jockeyed around over the course of the day. Oil changes, body work, auto body shop type activity. None of that is being proposed here. The gasoline fueling is really part of the convenience offering that is expected here. And we're starting to see this more and more with different types of integrated brands that are providing this service. What studies show is that as much as almost 90% of the traffic 
that comes in and out of the driveways that are being proposed for this type of use are already on the road today. These motorists, these vehicles are on the roadway system. They temporarily divert into the site on their journey to work or their journey home in the evening, and then they continue on their way. They're not new to the roadway system. In addition to that, you had a bank on the site with over 40 parking stalls, with drive-through facility. We're not taking any credit for the removal of that traffic. And associated with this business district, as you've heard from Mr. Nelson, there are a number of uses that could generate new traffic to this site that would be comparable to what is being proposed here. Again, I think it's important to note that a large majority of traffic that would come in and out of the site is already on the state highway system or the county roadway system, being that Central Avenue is under county jurisdiction. But be that as it may, we've conducted an extensive and comprehensive traffic impact study that has been submitted to the board that included returning movement counts and inventory and analysis and assessment of the surrounding street network and roadway network that has been provided to the board. We've taken the traffic associated with this project. We've conveyed it and moved it through the roadway network as a result of the redevelopment of the site. And if you were to look at the level of service standards that are provided or the metrics that we use to look at whether or not there could be an impact associated with this project. We're looking at on the order of less than 2% of the overall traffic at the nearby intersection of Central and Hicksville Road being associated with this project, and less than 1% if you were to look at only new traffic associated with the project. That is minimal at best and is not something that a driver through this roadway network would experience any change in their ability to move through the network associated with that level of traffic coming to and from the site. The access has been designed for the purposes of promoting safe and effective movements to and from the site. We have been approved by the Department of Transportation for the subject access point, and we have an ongoing coordination effort with Nassau County DPW as part of the 239F approval process as it relates to the Central Avenue driveway. And generally speaking, we have conceptual approval for that access point as well. <laughs> From a traffic perspective, the subject property would not have a significant impact on the nature of traffic flow through the roadway network and the adjacent network would not have a significant impact on nearby neighborhoods. All the parking is contained on the site. As you've heard, we have 32 parking stalls proposed, where 15 are being required, more than enough to accommodate the expected demand that we have here. We also have 16 fueling positions located underneath the gasoline fueling canopy, which would provide adequate capacity to accommodate the demand that we would expect at the site itself. Thank you, Mr. Olivia. That's our direct presentation. Okay, I have one, just sure. one, one more question. I appreciate what you, uh, <clears throat> your corporate does with the Marine Corps enforcement house. It's a wonderful program. Uh, now, the men and women coming home or the men and women that are serving right now, uh, would there be employment for them? Like, uh, any kind of priority for the men and women that are serving or the families uh, to, to get a job with 7-Eleven? I know that 7-Eleven has programs for returning veterans, and I can't speak more to that than, than that, but I will I will inquire and provide that information. And while you're inquiring, what about internships with a high school or college kids. I'll find out about both. Because that's all good neighbor stuff. Okay. Uh, I, can we have, uh, thank you for your presentation. Stay around because we have questions, a lot of questions from our community. We have a lot of, we have a lot of steps. Yeah. First of all, we also add that. Yes, I'm sorry. I'm, you know, I'm veteran oriented, so uh, the, the uh, Senior Councilwoman, would you like, like you to take into consideration NWBE concerns when you're retaining people to work at your facility? Sure. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Now, first. Uh... So we have Joseph Davids. <laughs> Mr. David, thank you for coming. Thank you for waiting so long to be patient. Thank you, Supervisor Gillen. Thank you, Councilwoman Dunn. Thank you very much. Thank you, Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Could you just state, start by stating your name and address for the record? My name is Joseph Davids. I live at 32 Living Place. I've uh, been living there with my family. I've uh, uh, lived, lived there 35 years. I've enjoyed living 
of the place, it's a cul-de-sac, it's a very quiet street, and uh, we've enjoyed living there. I now have a new addition, my uh, granddaughter's living with us, and so we have a young child. That's one of my main concerns of being here today. Uh, the area was a bank ever since we moved in, and it, it operated, you know, during the day. And there was traffic coming in and out, and that was fine, and it was a bank, and it wasn't a problem. Uh, Route 107 is already a very busy road, and a, a gas station a convenience store, what concerns me is the 24-hour operation, what concerns me is the sale of alcohol, because as we've seen from other convenience stores, people who purchase their alcohol there, they're going to, you know, it's not for on-premise consumption, but they're going to be in the neighborhoods around the surrounding blocks in the parking lot consuming that alcohol. And especially at night, especially on the weekends, it's going to be loud, it's going to be music coming from cars, there's going to be groupings getting together, it's going to be very, very crowded, there's going to be no break, seven days a week, 24 hours a day. I don't know if the uh, area is owned for 24 hours, it's never been before, my understanding was 8 o'clock at night. Uh, was the latest that business could, uh, could operate. Um, no matter how high the fence is, uh, the noise, you know, from my deck, which is going to be above the fence, you know, there goes my privacy. My privacy's gone from my deck, which is, my house is right behind the, uh, the proposed site, and there goes, my, there goes my privacy, all done. Running exhausts, we all know that there's going to be running exhausts. We know that there's going to be deliveries all the time whether it's a small man or a large truck making that delivery. We know that the rodent problem is going to get worse because they're uh, trash. Uh, it's going to be different from the banks. There's going to be foodstuffs. There's going to be uh, empty food containers. There's going to be discarded and expired food. So we know that we're going to have a rodent problem. We know that. Um, another thing that concerns me, uh, the uh, gentlemen were talking about giving us notice to talk to them. But the first I heard of it, I, this letter is dated November 26, 2019. It was sent to me by the registered mail, certified mail. So I, I had about 10 days notice. And in those 10 days, all my neighbors have, have been uh, getting together like I've never seen in my 35 years there. And as you're going to hear from some of them, uh, rubbing arms. You know, rubbing arms about what's going on. And especially living on the plume to begin with, uh, digging is not going to be safe. It, it, it can't be safe. They told us that 9 11 was safe a couple of days afterwards, and it wasn't. Uh, you know, it's a business, they're out to make money. I don't blame them, but my quality of life and my family, I believe, comes first. My time is up. Thank you. Well, I, I uh, maybe had some good questions that maybe we can have, like the. Uh, I know that a lot of 7 Elevens have no loitering signs out, so people can't, have the signs, but can't hang out and, and the the eight pieces being right up the block. I, I believe the owner across the street that they were talking about, like Farm Edge Road, is the same owner. Yep. He's not been a good neighbor. There have been people hanging. We hear the fights and the music. We hear it all night long from him already. And that's across Hicksville Road. That, that's and, pretty much hidden too. So I know the kids my other trees do hang out in there. Yeah. But, but they get shushed away. But They haven't been shushed. But, but this is a, a more open area. So it's, it's like a bigger area, I'm afraid there'll be more kids. The one up the block from my mom's house is on uh, uh, Jewsland Avenue, at East Village Green. Uh -huh. And it's wide open and nobody hangs out there because it's wide open. And I think this is it kind of like that, but, but uh, like, they still have to address that one. And the, the sale of alcohol, I understand that, it's, that they have uh, um, covenances on, on from a certain time to a certain time that they don't sell yeah, before the alcohol. Before I am until 8 p.m., that's it. So they're going to be there to buy their alcohol 10 minutes before 4 o'clock, and they'll be there until uh, till the sun comes up. I think that could be addressed some Debate law, I don't think it um, that, that might help. And then the fencing, because of the noise, it's not just a fence, I understand it's going to be be there, is that right? Uh, the, the buffer, some of the noise, the, the large uh, abalites or whatever that. Yeah, so, there's a model. Oh, I'm not, the shrubbery. They do have a beautiful display right up here. Um, so hopefully that will um, I, I really doubt that. I really don't. Because I remember my predecessor Kevin Hughes used to make them, like the path rock, made them put in bushes that the My second sound. floor, you know, I'm in a high ranch. My second floor will be above the fences, above the, the, the shrubbery. We're going to hear it full blast. 
let, let's get the new address. Nothing that client. Write those, write those notes down so we can, we can address them when, we, when they, you guys go in the back and they talk. Got it. Dave, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, sir. And uh, maybe we can have you address so, it just before it's closed. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. After we hear from the other residents, we can kind of address them. Barbara Medellin. I care that the gas station is there. 
and they act like it's yeah, it, his cars aren't going to be running, nobody's going to be there. They are. We know it. We see this ever weather from our window over there. So please, please do not let them get the gas station in there. Thank you, Mr. Kennedy. Uh, Ms. Medellin, would you like to come forward? Good afternoon, Board. Good afternoon, my name is Barbara Medellin. I live five miles the court in Beth Page. I've been living there for 29 years. Um, an Island Trades resident. Um, just to reiterate what Mr. Kennedy said about just having a gas station in the back of our property. Our homes are all, well, at least mine is, it's, it's a, a high range. So I sit out on my deck look out in the backyard, and now what's going to be there? A huge gas station. Ask yourselves, would you like a gas station sitting in your backyard? Our property values are definitely not increasing the way they're telling everybody that these property uh, values are going to increase. Our homes are our homes. We have a beautiful cul-de-sac. We all maintain our homes. Now we turn around and we look in our backyards, and we're going to have a gas station. They can glorify it all they want, but it's still a gas station. These beautiful trees that they're saying that they're going to put, are they going to bring 40-foot trees to cover what we're seeing from our homes? No. They're going to bring their little things, and maybe in 15, 20 years, it'll cover up what's back there. This is very exciting to all the residents, um, and we're just asking if you really take it into your hearts and consider what we do not want in our backyards. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Michelle Kennedy? <coughs> Hello, my name is Michelle Kennedy, and I live at 16 Monica Court. I have lived in the town of Hempstead for 50 years, and my current home for 23. So this is an important town to me. I remained here when I got married and decided that this is where I wanted to stay. When we purchased our home, we knew that there was commercial property behind our house, and we took that into consideration in terms of the value of our home. Looking at the commercial property, though, it was professional buildings. It was buildings that were open from 8 to 5, potential hours on the weekend, nothing that was full-time. Um, as we look at this property and, and the development that they're, they're talking about, um, the bank was there for years. Um, and one of the things that the bank had done was installed all of these wonderful trees along the back. As time went on, those trees became a big detriment. People walked through the parking lot, stopped, peed, their dogs were going and peeing all along those trees. The bank, in consideration of the fact that us as neighbors were concerned about that, removed those trees. So we're talking about these wonderful trees, and we already know what those trees bring. People loitering around them because it's an area for them to hide within. So how are you going to combat or address the needs of um, putting some type of a shield between us? Because we know trees are going to be an issue. Um, when we talk about property value, I will agree with what Barbara said. There is no way that that's going to keep our property value increasing as other houses within the area. Traffic is a concern. Um, we live the first block on Central Avenue past the, ent the entrance of this. At this point right now, there is a lot of traffic and making a turnout for our, our homes is difficult. More traffic going up and down that pathway to get into the back side of this building could make it more difficult. There have been accidents. I myself have been in an accident pulling out of my, my driveway or my block and it was not my fault. Um, and then we look at, you know, some of the other intersections. The one with Central Avenue and 107, which is right up the road from there. There, there are accidents there on a regular basis. Um, bad accidents. My best friend of mine and her daughter were killed at that intersection because of the amount of cars that go up and down there. The big thing that I'm looking at also is the fact that we have a 7-Eleven. I understand it's the same owner. I can see that 7-Eleven from my house. It's not that there is a huge need for a 7-Eleven bigger than the one that we have at this point right now. That, that parking lot is never jam-packed. You'll see it at times when there are no cars in there at all. There is also another gas station 500 feet away from there that has 10 to 16 pumps. I don't know how many it is. And that is accessible easily from both the northbound Wantua and northbound 107 and the, and the southbound um, Wantua Avenue. This one will technically be only accessible on the, on the northbound side. And if you look at the area, there are within a mile, 
for gas stations. There's no need for an additional gas station. People have mentioned plume. I mean, that is a big concern that we're going to disrupt that ground potentially, what the effect would be on the environment, and what the neighbors in the area would be uh, exposed to. I would appreciate it if you deny this motion. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Kennedy. Uh, next, we have Lillian Dvorak. I say hello to everyone. Um, you just start by stating your name and address, please. Lillian Dvorak, 33 Lynn Place in Beth Page. I'm a resident there for 46 years. I raised three sons there. Love the community. We're a tight, tight knit area. Um, I oppose this strongly. This is a health issue, all right? You're going to put a gas station there? That's fuel oil. My husband was a driver for one of the large fuel oil dealers. He died of throat cancer, and that was job related. And this is going to be in the back of my house. I watch my grandchildren. My sons don't want my. If this is put up, my sons don't want the kids coming there if that's going to happen to watch them. And it's pollution. I don't understand how this can even be considered. I'm actually shaking inside. God forbid there's an explosion. I mean, it's, it's probably not going to happen, but it could. What if there's an explosion? Our houses are going to be gone. Windows are going to be trashed, okay? You're going to have the smell of the gasoline. I went to fill up my gas the other day, okay? And I purposely wore gloves. And when I got into my car, I took the gloves off and I laid them on the seat. Picked them up two hours later and smelled them. That was disgusting. It smelled the gasoline. Um, this is a residential area. I beg you, people, please don't pass this. This is horrible for us. What if there's gasoline leakage underneath? All right, we're dealing with the plume already, which is a very, very scary thing for us. It's going to be 24 hours, 7, 7 11, 16 pumps. Would any of you want this behind your home? If this was Jericho or Sayaset, everybody would be fighting it too. And chances are, like someone else had said on another issue, Garden City. You know, so it, it, it's just not good. So I risk my case. I, I plead with you people. I beg of you people, please do not. I don't want to have to sell my house between the room and the this. You know, yes, it's going to be unsightly. I get that. I can deal with that. And I'm being honest about that. But for me, it's a terrible, terrible health hazard. I lost my husband because of this, all right? A little different, but he delivered. And he was on top of the trucks fueling. And I beg of you, please, I know you. I don't know if you remember me from Island Trees. My kids were. You know, play soccer and all that good stuff, you know, and they're very upset about it. They couldn't come because they don't live with me. Also, too, there's going to be loitering there. I'm alone. My husband is gone. So, therefore, if people get drunk back there and they want to make a, a I mean, it could be far fetched, they want to, they can come right into our homes. I don't want to live being afraid. So, I, I just, I beg of you people, please. I don't want to leave, but I want that page. Thank you. Thank you for coming, Lillian. Excuse me, I have a petition that we started. Can I put that in the record? If you would give it to Ms. Hansen, please, she will make a copy and disperse it to the council. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Kennedy. Uh, Mr. Vanessa, do you want to close out your application? <coughs> Just to check, was there anybody, I don't have any other slips, was there anybody else who'd like to be heard on this? Oh, yes, oh, two more people. My name is Brandon David, I live at 32 in place, um, right behind the property. Um, we currently have a 24 hour 7 Eleven right there. You spoke about the village green, how nobody hangs out there. That's because before this 7 Eleven was put there, that 7 Eleven, there was no 24 hour store. The 7 Eleven we have now, people hang out there.
You put a 7-Eleven there, I would listen, I'm part of the younger generation. We did. We hung out at 7-Eleven. It's a 24-hour store. You know, we're hanging around at midnight, have nothing better to do. We're going to be hanging around in the parking lot, causing trouble. Are you one of those kids out of my school? <laughs> <laughs> I went down on trees. I mean, we all had our fun. We were troublemakers. We know that. So uh, when I see a 24 hour store right behind my house, I'm like, we see it from, you know, me and my friends hang out on my back at night. So we see 7 Eleven. We see, you know, people getting pulled over right in front of it. We see people fighting. We laugh at it because we used to do it. So you put it right behind my house, it's just bringing it closer. We right now have a gas station. We have a 7 Eleven. What did the East mean to come on by the pool? That was recent, though. That wasn't for We've had this, we've had a 7-Eleven there, and we've had a gas station there for the longest time. Gas station closed for a while because it wasn't going good. This gas station just recently opened, and it's been five different gas stations since then. So we have a gas station, we have a 7-Eleven. If it's not broke, don't fix it. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Any other speaker? Billy wants another question. Yes, Lily, you mentioned she has a spoke and she'll come up and answer. Sir, if you would just sit down, you can state your name and address for the record, please. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Jay Blackman. I'm from uh, East Meadow, 1566 Gary Street, East Meadow. Uh, I come at this from a little different direction. Uh, last time I was here, somebody else was talking about putting up a gas station, and I recommended that maybe they would think of putting in electric charging stations. And I, I'm just reading that uh, a few of the uh, car producers are now turning to oil electric cars and for something that is, is the wave of the future. There are countries who, who are going to be outlawing gas-driven cars. The transportation industry is, is one of the key contributors to greenhouse gases. So, you know, I would, I would even uh, ask you to make a resolution of any type of gas station that would be put up would have to have electric charging stations. Uh, I know some people think that it might take a long time to charge their cars, but with uh, Tesla coming out with a 400 mile uh, battery that can drive a car 400 miles, it wouldn't take more than 10 or 15 minutes to charge a car enough miles to get to where you're going. So. Uh, that, that would be uh, what, what I would suggest, that we, we look towards the future to eliminate greenhouse gases. And th this would, would be one step in that direction, to put up electric charging stations wherever we have gas stations. I thank you. We're considering that, so thank you for you. Okay. Uh, last question, Mr. Hi, Barbara Davids, 32 Lynn Place. I also live in the house that immediately backs that gas station, have lived there for 35 years. Um, as my son said, we can hear everything that happens at the 7-Eleven across the street, which is why I don't open my windows at night, and now I definitely will not be able to because it'll be right in my backyard. The fumes, the fact that it's a 24 hour now, I, I'm not really sure what the law is when I bought my house, as far as I know, that was zoned for not to be 24 hours and not to have any food. And I don't know if and when that changed or if I was given incorrect information, but it was never supposed to allow a 24 hour operation there or a food operation. So those are both going against what I was led to believe I could be wrong. And there's gonna be the rats, the rodents, the noise, and as my husband said, He's not a good neighbor to begin with. That 7-Eleven is dirty, filthy, disgusting. The dumpsters, there's um, like puddles of dirty water, coffee, food. It's never cleaned around the parking lots. It's rarely swept up. And so I'm gonna have rats in my backyard with my brand new grandchild running around, getting bit by them. That's it, thank you. Uh, is, um, uh, can you check out, see if there is a special covenant um, for a young fool or a type of in, in, her, in that area? She said when she bought her house, there was a covenant for no food to be sold there or 24-hour or, uh, hour service. Mr. Vanessa, have you received So if there is some kind of covenant. I, I, I can't imagine that such a thing could be legal. It's 
it's possible that it was put in there in 1910 or something. If she has a deed, maybe it's in the deed, maybe it's in the check to come and see the deed to the property. But I would be going to check on the. I do want to search on that, Mr. Vanessa, if there's any covenants relating to this property. Yes. There are no covenants that restrict any kind of food use. There are no covenants that restrict sale of alcohol. There are no covenants that restrict hours of operation. Nor does the zoning have any impact on those things. The zoning, by, by law, cannot control, cannot impose 24-hour restrictions, cannot restrict those things that, that are being talked about. Okay. This is a business X zone. It's the commercial zoning district for the town of Hempstead. Restaurants are allowed, 7-Elevens are allowed, convenience markets, retail, office, professional office, and all of the, the personal service type and retail type and, and office type uses are unconditionally permitted in this district. So we're so we can talk order. about how you, uh, you could address some of the neighbors' concerns sure. briefly and then uh, perhaps you can meet with them in the, in the event that we reserve the decision. You're going to go with the folks in the back room in, the, in that conference room and address some of their their concerns. Yeah, I'm trying. Okay. See the glasses behind you. Yes, I'm. I'm not right now. Put your put your put your put your put your put your closing remarks. In the meantime, we're gonna we're going to I'm gonna uh, make a suggestion that uh, make can I proceed to can I respond to the assertions made and, and do a closing? Or are you going to close the hearing? Close it. Close it. Go ahead. Um, Can you try to keep them brief, please, Mr. Burke? Yes. Um, just in connection with some of the comments that were made, the 24 hours operation, the all the aspects of the 7-Eleven that they're concerned about, again, this is not about this being a 7-Eleven. A 7-Eleven is an as of right use, so it's really not pertinent. That being said, 7-Eleven has uh, strict policies in place. They don't want people loitering any more than anyone else does. They have, they have no loitering policies, they, they have a protocol that they operate to, to remove people who are loitering as need be. They also will have 24-hour cameras on this site, inside and out, uh, for security purposes. The concerns about deliveries, concerns about the activity at night, again, those are things that we can specifically address, whereas an as of right use would go completely unaddressed. We can impose conditions that there be no deliveries beyond certain hours that, that uh, we would agree to. No sanitation pickup, no fuel deliveries after hours. Everything could be controlled in the form of restricted covenants. Similarly, we will restrict delivery vehicles from using the Central uh, Avenue curb cut for access to the property. Now, regarding that curb cut, there was concern that it's going to generate traffic. That curb cut is a secondary curb cut for this site. The vast majority, as Mr. Illegal said, the vast majority of traffic you, uh, accessing this property is already on the road and it's going to be coming off of Hicksville Road. That Hicksville Road site is a right turn in and a right turn out, and it's specifically designed, this site is designed for northbound traffic on Hicksville Road. There was an assertion that the other gas station just uh, south of this is easily accessed from Hicksville Road. It is not accessed. Uh, easily from Hicksville Road. You either have to go up and make a U-turn and then go back to get to that gas station, or you have to cut through to uh, find a way to cut through North Lontor Avenue and come up that way. So that, that was uh, an inaccurate assertion. The, the safety issues, the, 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 the health issues that are asserted, the possibility of an explosion, I mean, look, obviously anything can happen anywhere. A plane could crash into town hall tomorrow. But if, if we're going to make, make our decisions based upon things like that, well then the board going to take into consideration the many, many other gasoline service station convenience markets that it's approved on sites that are much tighter than this, that have much less, not much lower setbacks. I'm looking at a, if you look at the page in the handout that says convenience store and gasoline service station site comparative comparison matrix. Those are all gasoline service stations that back up to residential properties. Our rear buffer to the building is 117.8 feet. We have, we have gas stations here that have been approved that have three foot rear buffers, two foot rear buffers, six foot rear buffers, zero foot rear buffers, six foot rear buffers. You have from the buffer to the pumps, 37 feet, 57 feet, 40 feet. We are 220 feet to the pumps in terms of this site. 
This is an extremely large site. It will make for very good site circulation. The, the uses that can go on this property, as we've discussed, as of right, will be far more intensive and far closer to the residential property owners than would this development. So when all is said and done, you can have a 24-hour CVS convenience market with a drive. Can we wrap up the comments now? And can everybody please not call out from the gallery? I'm going to make a motion to close the hearing, and uh, we're going to reserve the decision because of the concerns of, of the citizen. I'd like you to meet with them and, and, and maybe maybe uh, address some of the things that have been said already, as you're doing now. Um, and uh, in the back room, we'll have one-on-one -on -one with him and him and his crew to tell you pros and cons of what, what you're talking about. And then we're reserving the decision. We're not going to vote yay or nay today. They have a second motion. Second motion. Madam Clerk. Supervisor Gill. Aye. Councilman Blakeman. Aye. Councilman Diaz-Pazito. Aye. Councilman Dunn. Aye. Senior Councilwoman Boothby. Aye. Councilman Muscarello. Aye. Thank you for your time. Thank you Thank so you much. Excuse me, will we be advised of the new year time? There is no more. There, there will be, it will be noticed when there is another hearing time, and I ask you to speak with Mr. Bonesso, and, he, and so this way you can address some of your concerns as the councilman suggested, and uh, you can stay in contact with him. Okay? Thank you. It'll be on the decision calendar next. Thank you. Madam Clerk, will you please call the decision calendar? Yes, there is one item on the decision calendar. This is the proposed improvement and adoption of certain roads within Island Park, Barnum Isle, into the town of Hempstead Highway System near Island Park, Barnum Isle, Department of Engineering. May I have a motion on the decision calendar? Yeah, before I make the motion, I just, uh, probably two months ago, there was concern of residents here from Island Park. Uh, and I just want to thank from the Department of Engineering, Commissioner Tuman and Deputy Commissioner Tierney. Uh, they met with the residents and um, put them at ease and explained exactly what was happening here. Um, so I move uh, the decision calendar. Second. Madam Clerk. Supervisor Gillen? Aye. Councilman Blakeman? Aye. Councilman Diaz Pizzito? Aye. Councilman Dunn? Aye. Senior Councilwoman Goodby? Aye. Councilman Muscarra? Aye. Just, just for the record, you move that the application be granted, is that correct? Yeah, application granted on the decision calendar regarding the improvement and adoption of roads within Island Park. We need to recall the vote, Mr. Ryan. Who said it? All right, Madam Clerk, will you please call the administrative calendar? Uh, yes, there are items 14 through 87 on the administrative calendar. Uh, would I the administrative calendar? Does anybody want to sever anything before we make it? I move to amend item 30, the 2020 publication resolution insofar as to authorize and direct the clerk to publish required matters in Long Island Business News, but also in any weekly or daily newspaper regularly published in the town when such publication cannot be timely effectuated. And I also move to table item number 70. Second. Councilman, uh, I just want to be clear on the motion for number 30. Are you adding Long Island Business News? To all the publications that are listed here? I am removing the publications with and only listing my own business news. Okay, so don't we need to have a vote on the amendment first? Yes, we need to have a vote on the amendment. So just to be clear, the councilman has moved to amend the resolution, which is number 30, which provides for publication notices in a whole laundry list of local newspapers, and he is amending that that resolution to only provide for publication in the Long Island Business News. Is that correct, Councilman? Could I sign Also, any weekly or daily newspaper regularly published in the town when such publication cannot be timely effectuated. Okay. Uh, so do I have a second on that motion? Second. Madam Clerk? Supervisor Gillen? I vote no. Councilman Blakeman? Aye. Councilman Diaz Pazito? Aye. Councilman Dunn? Aye. Senior Councilwoman Boothby? Aye. Councilman Mosgrove. I, I just wanted to add to my vote to just explain it. I do think that notice is not given to residents when there's only publication in the Long Island Business News because it is not a widely circulated publication in the town of Hempstead. Um, I also believe that 
um, awarding notices is really something that the new supervisor should have the opportunity to weigh, on, weigh in on and something that he should be able to do at his next uh, his incoming organizational meeting. All right, and then are we severing anything? I'd like to table item number 70. Okay, so. So this number 70 is the um, resolution for the community choice aggregation uh, award of a contract uh, to a contractor to negotiate lower fuel rates uh, for red on behalf of residents living, residents and small businesses living in the town of Hempstead. Um, and so we had, we did receive a letter of support from the Baldwin Chamber of Commerce supporting this resolution. Um, which we will make part of the record. Uh, so we have it to hand up to Ms. Clark, not with comment because the motion is to table it, but if you could hand it up to uh, Ms. Hansen, rather. Um, There's also a Libby uh, letter support. Uh, and there is one from, the, from Libby as well. All right. So we have a motion and a second to table the CCA. Can I get a letter from the Links organization? Yes. If you would just say, just specify who the letter is. Is the letter in support or against? Yes. And who is it from, sir? Links, L-I-I-N-C-S organization. The Links organization. All letters in support of the CCI. All right, so we have a motion to table it and a second. Madam Clerk? Supervisor Gillen? I do not support tabling this item. If this item is not voted on at this meeting, there is virtually no chance that any residents will see any savings on their fuel costs. Uh, before the close of this winter season, according to uh, the vendor. The new supervisor in Newsday they reported that the incoming supervisor should have an opportunity to weigh in on this, um, enabling legislation to allow the town to go out and seek a vendor to negotiate on behalf of the residents was something that was unanimously approved by this council. The incoming supervisor will have the opportunity to weigh in on this matter because when the vendor goes out and negotiates rates, um, they will have to come back to this board once again to award the contract. So the supervisor, the incoming supervisor will have an opportunity to weigh in it. I urge my colleagues to change their mind because we really have an opportunity right now to s deliver some savings to our residents in this town and this only will go forward if residents save money and if we delay this, there is very little chance that any residents will be able to save money uh, this winter season. Councilman Blakeman? Aye. Councilman D'Esposito? Aye. Councilman Dunn? Aye. Senior Councilwoman Goosby? Aye. Councilman Mastrella? Aye. Okay, so now may I have a motion on the administrative calendar? I move the administrative calendar with exception of those items that have been tabled. Second. Okay, I have numerous slips. Felix Pocacci? Felix Pacacci. Um, on item number 54, I think that it's written very poorly. Um, criminal law is a complex subject, but the resolution presented by the town board is vague and does not address in any way that complexity. Board members don't like parts of the state legislation. They should suggest specific changes. For all the issues raised in this resolution, the town should provide their position on how they would like to see the legislation written. Just giving a lot of vague things, I don't like this and I don't like that, really doesn't give our elected officials in Albany any guidance as to what you know we're going to do. You know, I think we should specify what we want so they have some guidance. Um, on item number 69, Authorizing amendment to the town's procurement policy, getting rid of the $50,000 limit. Hooray. I mean, it was illegal when you passed it, now you're getting rid of it. You know, it's good that you did that. Um, um, on number 68, also that's a good thing, suspending that rule of tabling things indefinitely. It was a dumb rule that just violated uh, minority rights. It served no public purpose except to just frustrate the supervisor and that's all you wanted to do and I guess you accomplished that. Um, 
Item number 37, I'm not sure is this correct, but we're authorizing acceptance of enough sponsorship for the 2019 calendar. So that's from last year's calendar, not the 2020 calendar. That's, that's correct. Okay, uh, I just don't understand that. Um, the Franklin Square Bulletin on item about, about the newspapers should not be one of our listed newspapers because the person is a, who owns the paper, is an editor of the paper, is an employee, and there's no public disclosure of the input that he has into that paper, and it may be a consequence. Are you talking about 30? That's been, um, amended, that's the, been amended, so. 30, but the, it, the 30, it, uh, the designated newspapers. Right, uh, that Constantine Diaz Cazito amended it, so now it's Long Island Businesses. With no other papers? Uh, except in certain <laughs> circumstances. Well, okay, well, actually, I wanted to speak on the amendment of that, because that's why I wanted to get that clarification. We should never have an open-ended resolution where it's just anything someone feels like doing. You know, this those, morning, papers, those papers should be specified in the resolution. I don't like vague resolutions. I don't think anyone should like vague resolutions. So uh, I think we should do that. Supervisor, I may for a moment. This morning I received a letter from the editor of the Federal Square Bulletin who asked that his name be removed anyway, which is what the council of Esposito's motion did, motion but they will not accept anything from any uh, advertising from the town or any public, public notices from the town. Okay, that's, that's a good start. Um, um, on the personnel issues, I believe we have uh, people uh, who's a, I didn't know this at the time, a, uh, a relative of the personnel director. I think that that's a conflict of interest that, that should never happen, that you know, a person like that should never be hired. I don't see how you could have an organization where you have, uh, we already have so many relatives here, and then one that's related to the personnel director I think is inappropriate. Um, and also, I'm happy to hear that Joe Rod's enforcing meeting rules. I'm very happy to hear that. I shouldn't have to say that. Mr. Mr. Prakash, I just need to comment one thing. Um, I know you mentioned about the um, human resources director. And I have to say that because someone is, especially as someone who, who's been a, a victim of this, if there's someone that works hard and earns a, a right to be promoted or um, in, improve in uh, their career, and they shouldn't be held back because of their last name. All right, people need to be held as individuals. And I know for a fact this individual works extremely hard, he's extremely competent, and he deserves to have a promotion. Just because he has a last name that you don't like shouldn't be into consideration. That, that, that wasn't my point. That's my point. Okay. Your time is up, thank you. You're not, you're not talking on, on what I, speak, I spoke to. Someone like that should never have been hired to start with. And if you, Thank you, if you look at Pops, he, I, and he can respond. He, he said something, why does he get last licks? He, he, he he's saying, he's bringing up an issue. It, there are many companies that will not hire relatives. If, you're, if you work there, they will not hire your relative because there's always become a conflict of interest there. And here we, we seem to like just dismiss that. Thank you, Mr. Prakashi. Valerie Lamp. Felix, Merry Christmas. <laughs> Good afternoon, Valerie Lamp, St. Augustine, Florida. Wow. Yeah, I highly recommend it. <laughs> um, I actually, I wanted to ask about uh, resolution number 68. I just wanted to get a little clarity because I'm seeing this for the first time. But, so this resolution is uh, reversing the procedure about uh, indefinitely tabling things, items? It's suspending it. It's so those items could be considered. Is that, um, is that going to be retroactive? It's suspending it for this, uh, this meeting only. It's just... <laughs> I am, am I the only one that's confused? I'm sorry, I'm just trying to... So, if I remember, there was a, a meeting where uh, they decided that they were going to table something and they could table it indefinitely. So that's still there, right? Or no? That's part of the rules. 
Okay, but now they're suspending the rule for one meeting? We need to consider those items. That's the resolution to suspend the rule so those items can be considered. The rule is still in place, although with the new incoming supervisor, that rule might change because I think it was specially designed for me. That's not fair. This is your last minute. Why would you say it? We need to die. <laughs> I'm, sorry. I'm sorry you feel that way. I, I, so can I ask what, what is being brought back that was tabled indefinitely? There's a list in the resolution. I know, I can't get to it on my phone right now. It's, the re it's like 375 pages and it's not coming up. Can anybody maybe save me the homework? I'm just we, have, we have a block on it because you live in Florida. I know it. <laughs> Don't be jealous. Don't be jealous. Well, one, of the, one of the items on there is notice agenda, which would have enabled you, it's one of the items that was tabled that would have modernized the clerk's office and enabled you to actually search uh, the PDF format and actually pull that out independently. So that's one of the items that's on there in that list. To make it easier for you to review the agenda to find things you're interested in. Okay. Um, I, anyway, uh, the other question I just wanted to uh, ask because I'm curious by nature, but um, with regards to the advertising, right? So Long Island Business News is excellent. In spite of living in Florida, I still subscribe to them. And uh, I think everyone really could benefit from them. But anyway, but other than that, um, how do we go about selecting which newspapers to advertise with or which periodicals? And I'm just asking because in all sincerity, it does seem many times that newspapers in general, it could be the New York Times, it could be, you know, the Washington Post, they tend to have, uh, they tend to favor a political party, whether it's the left or the right, the, uh, the New York Post, right? So how do we go about selecting advertising dollars to, and, and pick which periodicals to advertise with? So this resolution relates to the publication of notices, and the way that's decided is by town board resolution. So that's what this resolution actually does. And if it changes, it'll also be in the next administration by town board resolution. Okay. Thanks. Thank you, Thank you. Richard Shuren. Thank you. Robert Loss. So my name is Ephraim Gersberg, and I'm one of the owners of the Woodmere Club. What I'm going to discuss over the next few months is one of the most important decisions we'll make in terms of whether the town of Pennsylvania will be guaranteed to spend millions of dollars in litigation costs. You may recall that two years ago, with no notice to the public, or us, the owners of the property, Mr. Blakeman and Mr. Esposito, tried to create a golf course zone restricting development of the local golf courses. It was obvious that this was a target at the Woodmere Club, and couched in terms of all golf courses in Hempstead. Due to our uproar from ourselves and the public, including the Five Town Civic Association, the proposed zone was shelved for the last two years. <laughs> Since that time, we've attempted to try to meet with Mr. Blakeman and Ms. Esposito. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. The, I apologize, thank you, I apologize. No, no. Okay. Both have refused to meet. That's right, two years and not one meeting. This past year, we received a request from Supervisor Gillen's office to look at alternatives to the Woodmere Club. At that same time, we had a mass request for over 50 residents who asked us to consider age-restricted condos so they can downsize and still live in the five towns. We were also asked to lessen the amount of single-family homes. In an effort to come up with an alternative that would take into account these requests, we put together a plan which included not only, which included only 65 one-acre lots, an age-restricted project which would be spread over 10 acres, and 12 acres of active recreation space which would be open for public use. This plan reduced the number of single-family homes in the Hempstead section of our property by 90%, by reducing the number of single family homes from 247 to 28, with the remaining 37 homes in Lawrence and Woodsburg. <coughs> to be clear, this proposal is financially worse than our as of right zone. 
We presented the plan to the supervisors represented at a meeting which was also attended by the Five Town Civic Association. The plan was well received by Hempstead and we intended to bring the concept out to the Board of Government. To this end, we invited Mr. Blakeman and Mr. Esposito, D. Esposito, as well as representatives from the village of Woodsburg and Lawrence to a meeting which would take place tomorrow night to discuss this alternative. Instead of agreeing to meet with us to try to work together, Mr. Blakeman has attempted to influence all the other villagers' representatives to not attend the meeting. He has done his best efforts to foil any settlement or attempts to work cooperatively. Mr. Blakeman has also gone around espousing his truce, chief among them that we have now offered to compromise. For the record, so we are clear here today, approximately two and a half years ago we offered to reduce our zoning from 285 homes to 190 homes, over 32% reduction. Moreover, we met with representatives of the Town of Hempstead government and presented an alternative plan which included 65 homes, age-restricted, and 12 acres of open space. Even with no one on the government side trying to come up with a solution cooperatively and instead leading us down to an expensive trip to the federal court, we the landowners are still willing to compromise. Having said that, if we are forced to go to federal court and proceed with litigation that will cost the town millions of dollars, we will do so and we will win our 285 homes. Of that I am certain. If you ask me how I know if I'll win in federal court, I'll answer you. Thanks to, if you don't mind, Mr. I can have my attorney and Robert just continue this speech, but we'll, he, they will not speak I, if I finish. I, the town attorney just said I cannot allow people to concede their time, so I have Mr. Lewis's advice. I'm sorry.
being in touch with your attorney. Your attorneys have revealed the plan that you are going to unveil tomorrow. Uh, so long as we are in litigation or threatened with litigation or both, uh, we are not going to attend the meeting. Councilman Diaz-Pazito and myself, he can speak for himself. Uh, the fact is, I did not coerce anybody not to attend the meeting or tell anybody they should not uh, attend the meeting. I did discuss whether or not we would be attending the meeting, Councilman Diaz-Pazito and I, and for myself, I said that so long as there was litigation or threat of litigation, that I was not going to attend a meeting by the developer. So that is my position, but um, as you are aware, and for the record, um, we have been talking with your council, and your council has been sharing information with us. We've been sharing information with your council, which is uh, something that I think could be helpful sometime in the future. But for now, uh, we have this intermunicipal agreement, which we think is best for the residents of the town of Hempstead, and uh, basically it is a, an agreement for the town to cooperate and work together with the village of Lawrence and the village of Woodsburg because we all share jurisdiction in the whole site. So that's the purpose of this. There's nothing nefarious about it. It's just an agreement to work together. Hey, with respect to uh, Councilman Blakeman, um, I have to just correct something because I personally spoke to people that said that you called them, pressured them not to come to the meeting. I'm sure, I'm, uh, let, 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 let me, 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 I want to respond to that. I had a written statement from them or have them come before us and say that I exerted pressure. There was a discussion on whether or not town officials would participate and they were told that we would not participate so long as there was litigation or threatened litigation in any meeting called by a litigant. Okay. I, I don't. If you want to meet with our, if you want to meet with our attorneys, since there is litigation, we'd be happy to provide our attorneys to be available to meet. Uh, Councilman Diaz, I think that pretty much sums up. Yeah, well, I don't see where you have litigation. You, you were sent out a letter inviting you to come to hear an alternative. There was no uh, mention of litigation in that. And I'm sure, I know you've been doing this a long time, that even if you thought that there's litigation, there's still the benefit to speak or to hear a plan. <laughs> and you want to be clear, I want to be clear that there was no litigation. the town officials spoke with your attorneys about what your rollout was going to be tomorrow night? My, my understanding was that we had members of people that, of, of towns that agreed to have come, and then after you spoke to them, they said they're not coming. So we can get into that. We don't they, have were to get into the that they were on the impression that I was coming, and that Councilman Diaz-Cazero was coming, and on the advice of our council, oh. uh, we... Uh, Said we were not coming, so I guess they maybe talked to their attorneys as well. Okay. I'm not going to, I'm not going to try and, and speculate as to why, but there certainly was no pressure exerted. I don't con have any control, neither does Council Piasquizito, over independent elected officials from villages. The point is that there was an invitation to come hear a alternative of what has been going on for the last two and a half years. I, I've been doing this a long time, close to 40 years. I deal with hundreds of townships. I have never experienced anything like this, where you don't come to listen, you don't come, you can listen and say we hate it. You can come listen and say I don't think this is going to be good. You can come and say we're listening and, and this is not for us. Did, did you sue us, Mr. Weiss? Did your organization sue us? Yes, we sued you for an illegal moratorium. So, so what? It's it nothing best, personal, Mr. Is it, no, no. Isn't, isn't it best for your attorneys to be in touch with our attorneys and they can discuss these things and we can do it in a proper way? If you're going to have a public meeting, a town meeting that you call for the public, that's fine. We're, we're not objecting to that. It's all, what we're saying is so long as there is litigation or threat litigation against the town, and I think the villages feel the same way, that uh, it's not in our best interest to attend. I think, okay, I hear what you're saying, but. Sorry, sir, your, your time is up. Um, if you want to have somebody else's additional statement, Mr. Brown, I suppose you can And it's uh, Christian Brown, uh, attorney for the 
the, the uh, applicant here on this matter. I'm just going to finish the statement of my client um, <clears throat> with respect to the, the legality of the resolution. To be clear, this resolution is, a new, is illegal in numerous areas, including binding this board to other villages, impairing your ability to do your job. It does the same to the other boards. Uh, in a sense, it, 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 essentially it's giving the uh, various jurisdictions veto power over zoning decisions made in, in one village could be vetoed by the town or the other village and vice versa. Uh, we would ask why you need to give up your control over your own zoning, and we also don't believe that that's permitted under the statute. Uh, finally, Mr. Blakeman has uh, indicated a uh, desire at one point for a nine-hole golf course to remain on the site. Um, the county, Nassau County, has informed both of both of my clients that they will not run a golf course as the golf course will lose between a half a million and a million dollars annually, not to mention the absorbing cost of purchasing the land from the client. So I would ask that you, Hempstead's uh, I'm sorry, representatives, uh, inform the, the taxpayers of Baldwin Freeport and other areas in Hempstead uh, that putting a million dollars towards the repair and upkeep of roads and infrastructure is better than running a nine hole golf course. Uh, my clients would suggest to you that, uh, that all of the members of this board uh, protect all the residents of the town and try to act in a way that will prevent litigation. It's been clear if the rezoning is contemplated in this resolution is passed, uh, we will file uh, uh, action against it. Uh, we made the same uh, admonition to this board before with respect to the moratorium, which we won, and we will you know, press all of our rights in court if we are required to do so. Please don't make us pursue that same course of action. And just a final note, I, I have been in touch, Mr. Blakeman, you're correct. I gave you a sense of what my clients wish to discuss. And I want to say, and I think it's okay for me to say publicly on the record, that obviously anything that would be discussed in this forum would not be used in litigation. That would be agreed to beforehand. It would be in the nature of settlement discussions. And I think what my clients are really trying to just explore, the board and the members, is to work collaboratively on a plan for developing the golf course. There's the plan for the single family homes, and then there's this alternative plan that has been developed at their own cost and expense, uh, which I personally think has quite a lot of merit. It would provide a lot of, and preserve a lot of open space and radically reorient the kind of development that's proposed. All we're really looking for is feedback and direction and hope that by all the municipal officials coming together with the developer, a viable plan could be arrived at. That's really the purpose of this. But with respect to this resolution, as I, yes, as I indicated to Mr. Weiss, we're more than happy to make our attorneys available uh, to your council uh, for any meetings they want to discuss. Um, I'm not going to go point by point to refute what was said. I will say this, there's nothing in that agreement that takes any power or control away from this town board with respect to this matter. Well. With, with respect to, 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 to getting together, I will continue to be in touch with uh, Mr. D'Esposito, your office, and the supervisor's office, etc. and perhaps we can come to a structure of a meeting that's comfortable, and then we can show everybody what it is what, that we're proposing, which I think will be a good base for further discussion. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Thank you very much. Uh, next, we have Michael Watt. Uh, uh, Marcia De, De, De Thierry. Marcia De Thierry, 34 Lee Avenue, Merrick. I am here today regarding uh, the resolution to the Tree Preservation Act. I've been coming for approximately five years and it's finally on the calendar and I thank you for that. I did email the board members uh, a wonderful article, local paper, and a little note. I don't know if you received the email. I have to give one to the supervisor. Are you talking about the Herald article? I'm sorry? Are you talking about the Herald article? Yes, that did circulate. Wonderful. We already circulated. Yeah. And I just wanted to say, um, please say yes to resolution calling to update tree preservation law in our township. Do it for a cleaner, noise reduced, water absorbing environment for our children and future generations. Please don't give in to developers that build only for profit, destroying our beautiful environment, and are not around to see the consequences of their action. Thank you in advance. Thank you, ma'am. This is Craig.
Mary Ellen Cray, 436 North East Avenue, Uniondale. Uh, my first question is about item number 21. Is that the uh, large property on Uniondale Avenue that used to be owned by the doctor who was sadly mowed down? It's a large property. It's yes, about fifty feet along Uniondale Avenue. Good afternoon, supervisor members of Hamlet. That is the uh, old church property. The white, white building. It's a white building, right? But it might. Confusion is because of this mixed-use building. What is that? Mixed-use. That's how it was originally zoned. So, but that is the property. Really? Okay. So it has the house, the garage in the back, and then a large empty space right. on the south side. Right. Okay. Very good. And you wouldn't know the, the house number. Six fifteen. Six fifteen. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and on item number twenty-four. I presume that is already work that was done on uh, Nostrand Avenue. Is that just approving that, or is there is more work to be done on Nostrand? I haven't gone down there recently, but I would. Uh, Chairman, I believe this is additional work that's going forward. Is that correct? That's correct, yes. It's good. additional work that's going forward there. And on the um, I think they have that much detail. senior center is a senior council. You meeting. should ask the question. Who's knows I make use of several senior exercising programs and appreciate the contribution to helping me keep on moving. So I'm glad to see that uh, senior enrichment is a priority here. On the um, sponsorship for the calendar, I really appreciate the calendar. I know several people who've had their uh, photos uh, displayed in it, and it really is a very pleasant thing to see. It also gives us an opportunity to see what the calendar is going to be for the future. Um, on the water quality, of course, we support anything that will improve the water quality. Uh, but were these competitively bid? Uh, yes, uh, Commissioner. Good afternoon, Supervisor, members of the Town Board. I'm Donald Town Deputy Commissioner here on behalf of the Department of Water. Um, the Department of Water issued a number of RFPs to permits previously qualified under RFQ number 6-2019. And based on overall scores, giving any considerations to the money, uh, we feel that um, the proposals that we receive are the most responsive the best value. Does that satisfy you, Ms. Craig? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Thank Commissioner. Um, so I wanted to ask about <laughs> item number 54. Could somebody explain to me what that is? Please, thank you. Extremely important to everybody, every resident in the town of Hempstead. Uh, Councilman D'Esposito and I, and, and I got to tell you, Councilman D'Esposito, in his previous life, took me into councilman, was a detective in New York City, and he was had to live under the existing rules of law and the judiciary system. Now, there's been a wholesale attack on it, our judiciary system, where uh, the sense of the town board is asking them to reconsider the legislation that they put forth, the, where our resolution is imploring the state of New York to immediately amend or delay implementation of the bail and discovery reform laws that will endanger the people of New York and reverse decades of bipartisan progress in reducing crime. There's things like the federal community look at. Thank you. Thank you. That's, uh, Right now, things are being looked at like the alternative to incarceration. Everybody wants to change a little bit, not wholesale uh, what they're looking to do with the uh, incarceration. January 1st, 347 prisoners are going to be let out of Nassau County Jail into the streets of, of uh, 
East Meadow, Salisbury. Salisbury has right across the street is East Meadow High School. Right next to the jail is the senior housing. On the other side, on the south side of it, is the hospital where people really hurt. So to let 347 prisoners out on January 1st is, is simple. It's wrong. We have to stop it. We have to do something. So we're going to do a, a sense of the town for what, which hasn't been done in the past. But we have to do something. And the, uh, the wholesale attack on the judicial system it affects the health, safety, and quality of life of the yeah. men and women in our township. So we in our town, I don't know what the rest of the state's going to say or want to do, but we are going to take a stand and we're asking them to delay it or eliminate it, immediately amend it. So that's what that has to do with it. It's, it's, it's a hard thing. They say it's worth a scope. You know, I've looked at a little bit of the, the hearing that the county legislature had about this. And the district attorney's office said that no, they, when somebody's arrested for mugging somebody in their home or rape or whatever, they're given 15 days to go back to the scene to do discovery with their attorney. Whoever the culprit is, to go back to the scene. So the person that was traumatized once, and that's trauma that you that you won't believe how bad that kind of trauma is. They get traumatized again because in 15 days they're allowed to go right back to that bedroom and, and in that house and traumatize you again just being there. And then they got to be traumatized again in court when they have to testify about it. That's gotta, this is nonsense. It's got to be stopped. And we have to do something about it. I, I want to thank uh, uh, our councilman Diaz Esposito for, for uh, bringing this to, to ahead today and making us uh, do something about it. Maybe we're the only form of government in the state of New York that's doing something about it. But I, I really hope that my colleagues uh, join with me in passing this, and then with the uh, Councilman Esposito in, in passing this, and anybody else wants to weigh in on it, we let more happen. This, this law is dangerous to the residents of the town of Hempstead that's being passed in Albany. Mandatory release, the discovery provisions that are in there. So I am very happy to join with Councilman Esposito and Councilman Dunn, and I hope uh, everybody on this town board be passing this resolution and letting the governor and the state legislature know that they are going too far with criminal rights and not being as protective as they should be about the citizens of this state and especially here in the town of Hempstead. And I might say that many of them are coming to the village of Hempstead, Uniondale, and Roosevelt because wherever they were picked up or wherever they live, that's where they're coming. So I'm very concerned about that as well because we have many kids on the street and I don't want anybody touching the children or us as far as I'm concerned. So I'm certainly you know, for this. I've already spoken to many who are involved with it and we'll let you know what we're doing. But we're going to do that. We've got to do something to protect us. We, please don't call out for the gallery, Mr. Edmondson. You know, we, we do uh, already, already dealing with the district attorney's office uh, for the alternative to incarceration with regards to veterans, men and women that come home from the war, scarred mentally or physically, and their family has have problems, and they self-medicate, and they have to be taken care of differently than a regular kid who graduated high school and, and dropped out of college or whatever, did whatever they had to do. A man and woman serve our country proudly, and they come home and they're mentally scarred or physically scarred, and there's a uh, an alternative to incarceration, get treatment for what's bothering them. That's so important, and that, that's what we're trying to get done in Nassau County and in our neighboring counties. You know, we, I can go on a long time about this, but I don't know if you want to brief me on it, that's as, as brief as we can get. Anybody else want to? I'll just say that I think our own district attorney has great concerns about this about this legislation as well. So, Thank you. Thank you for asking. Um, so now the, um, uh, on the 58 and 59, that is to go from Front Street to Hempstead Turnpike? Uh, this, what, 
Commissioner, do you know what the scope of this engineering is offhand? I just don't have it. This is the streetscaping. Yes, I know it's the streetscaping. I'm no, no, no. I'm trying to get the parameter for you. Is the commissioner here? He's not here, but we'll get back to you, Ms. Craig, with the exact uh, boundaries. Okay, thank you. Because, of course, uh, we've all been working on this Nostrum Garden specifically, and we're very concerned to see that it's properly done. It's going to be done properly. What this is, we already have this in place. Right. And what this is, is authorizing <laughs> the acceptance of the bid that we have put up. Because one bid, the one for Unidale, we only got one bid the first time. And we sent back again, it's staying on one bid, that's it. And now we're doing what we're doing now is accepting those bids. And I believe we're extending the scope as well, too. It is being extended to two more blocks on Unidale. Yes. Thank you. On item number 70, I really uh, regret to see that this has been tabled. I feel that this board has chosen politics over the public, and um, instead of helping us to have savings for the residents, um, I just have to shake my head over the way it's done. Ms. Ms. Craig, your time is just about up to you. Yes. Just double checking to make sure that I've covered all the items. Thank you. Thank you. I, I'm surprised that you didn't say anything about trees because I know that that is your number one topic. Because you know I had <laughs> I knew you'd be very happy to see that, Ms. Craig. Thank you. Patty Harris? Civic Association in Union Day. Um, item 21, uh, my question for that, I would like to thank the uh, uh, buildings department. I've been working uh, quite a bit on this issue to get, uh, have this building uh, demolished, and I, I thank them for that. We've been going back and forth for several months, but I'm glad that it's finally on the calendar. Uh, my question is, when will uh, the demolition begin? Uh, Commissioner, can you answer that question, please? As per the uh, contract, they have 60 days to start. Um, my office has reached out to the contractor this morning, told them that this was on the calendar and that we would want to move it as quickly as possible and they said they would do everything possible. Thank you. So, uh, 60 days commissioner would be, we would say, at the latest, around maybe being liberal in the March time frame? Yes. Okay. 
Thank you. Uh, Mr. Uh, Commissioner, rather, I'd like to thank you for working with these students collaboratively, and if you could just keep her abreast of what's going on going forward, that would be, I'm sure, appreciated by Ms. Jacob and the Minister of Army Civic Association. Thank you, Supervisor. Um, items uh, number 58 and 59, again, uh, the Supervisor Civic Association has been working extremely hard on moving this project forward um, into phase two. And I'm happy that it's on the calendar today. We do have some additional uh, residents in Uniondale that have come to uh, actually, you know, see this project on our calendar today, and we appreciate that. Uh, my question is, uh, Ms. Cray had asked a couple questions before, but uh, my question is, when will this project uh, begin? The streetscaping, what, what is that going forward? Oh, the future's not here. We'll find out in the day. Thank you, Supervisor. And uh, lastly, I know it's tabled, but uh, my question, and I guess I would get, as Ms. Uh, Mina Meredith, Meredith would say, crickets on this, but why would, uh, why would a program, a uh, community choice aggregation, uh, why would this be tabled when Residents in the town of Hempstead pay so much taxes, we pay a lot of money in taxes, anything that would reduce monies that we pay out, why would something like this be tabled? This is not looking out for the residents of uh, the town of Hempstead. Crickets. But thank you. Thank you, Ms. Jacobs. Okay, I don't have any other slips on the administrative calendar. Is there anyone else who'd like to be heard? Meet Jay Mary Baldwin resident. Uh, let's say where this one began. This one began. Um, the issue with the fireworks. Just uh, comment, commentary uh, with regard to people who have PTSD, like myself. Um, it would be nice. If we're talking about notifying residents in the nearby communities about such things. If we let that be known, I believe there was a group in Rockville Center that recently had their fireworks display, and I know that the first precinct got a number of calls because we met with them and the new inspector with regard to that. And a number of my older residents were very concerned about that. And, um, so just some consideration for that. Um, point of information, um, particularly I guess with um, Legislator Dunn, I definitely always appreciate your you know, outreach and preference and support for veterans. But women of color are the leading recruits in the military. So when we talk about minority women, veteran, business development aspects, they are the least in sales receipts. So I would hope that we focus collectively and collaboratively when we talk about any covenants or regulations or policies or procedures that are speaking to economic development and empowerment that we look towards being inclusive um, consistently. And with regard to that, item 41, 42, 43, 44, those businesses, organizations, H2M architects seems to come up a lot uh, with regard to projects and I'm just concerned again about the lack of outreach in terms of making this more of a diverse and inclusive process and, and contracting. I'm concerned that there was one bid that was mentioned with regard to the streetscaping. I, again, I challenge this, the incoming team for this, for this body uh, for the town of Hempstead to hopefully be a little bit more aggressive and proactive and, and actually have more results. I know that um, Supervisor Gillen had some significant challenges, um, but again, at the end of the day, we still have residents who are leaving in droves um, in, this, in this location. And again, people of color are not being represented, uh, whether we're talking about an entrepreneurial standpoint or an employment standpoint, so we need to make sure that we fix that and work towards judiciously um, addressing that. Um, planning and economic development, we definitely need to do a better job, but I would like to acknowledge um, reading recently about Mr. Bakich leaving. I want to um, definitely give him kudos for the work that he did, and it was um, a pleasure working with him in his various capacities because it is a hard job in many instances, and we don't always recognize the people who work behind the scenes, so I did want to make note of that. I have a question about number 20, if someone can speak to that.
Yes, what are your questions, Meredith? Um, when we're talking about um, this particular contract that is coming, it is connected to storm recovery funding. I just wanted to know what was some of the background with that and if there is some type of, again, we were talking earlier when the developer was here about all these various covenants and how we're going to make things work and make it inclusive and, and address the needs of residents. I'm just curious as to how we're addressing state and federal statutes with type this. I understand that. I would like to finish my point, Senior Councilwoman. I'm trying to warm up for being in those seats for three hours, so I'd like to get all of my points out before I get put out of the seat. Thank you. Supervisor Council, Deputy Chair, Deputy Commissioner of Engineering. Um, this is one of the GOSA projects. Uh, in terms of MWBE, um, it's got a 15% goal for minority and women business enterprises. They're required to give some utilization plan that is approved by the Governor's Office of Storm Recovery. So in this case, um, Allen Industries will be doing a roadway grade race to the town. And again, they have to sub 15% to minority business enterprises and 15% to women business enterprises. And who actually monitors how this happens on a local basis? Both the engineering department and the governor's office of storm recovery do. Okay. And would this would this qualify for any type of waiver if they come back and say basically we couldn't find anybody, so we want to basically bring in our same friend or relative? Again, they're expected to meet the fifteen percent W and fifteen percent minority portion of utilization plan they submit with their bid. Okay. Okay. Like I said, I mean, that answered it for the most part. And, and Deputy, by the way, thank you very much for the work that you've done uh, in my district with respect to these matters. The park looks magnificent. The conservation area looks great. And uh, the engineering department did a magnificent job of working with the state on this. And I know you'll do a great job with the road raising as well. Thank you so much. And my last question is I had four seconds left before my time ran out. Item 452. I don't think it's in the future. Item 52. I had question marks as to how much and for what are we authorizing execution of the personal service contract for human resources related consulting services for the year 2019 as we're coming to the end of 2019. Mr. Rocky? Mr. Sam? This is for empowerment, I believe, yes? Um, this is primarily uh, inter our interaction with the State Civil Service Commission regarding uh, the regulations involving what's called 211 waivers, which are for uh, public employees that have retired from one entity that go to work for another public employee. It's a process that has to be um, administered and uh, results provided to the state for their approval. And how much is it? Uh, $1,500. Uh, so this is one case for $1,500? Uh, or is it $1,500 per case? No, it's a $1,500 for one issue, but there were several steps to the issue, several actions that had to be taken. I see. Okay, thank you. Okay. Just lastly, I agree with item 66 with regard to accepting the final generic environmental impact statement. Um, and I will address item 69 with the incoming supervisor. Thank you, Senator. Okay, Madam Clerk, can you call the roll on the administrative calendar, please? Supervisor Gillen. Uh, with respect to item number 14, um, which is a parade permit filed by Matt Brennan, he's a member of my staff, so I recuse myself uh, with respect to item number 18. I also recuse myself because I am a member of that club. Uh, with respect to item number 49, I abstain. With respect to item number 50, um, I also abstain because I have great concerns about the legality um, of that agreement. I agree that, in, that municipalities, where there is overlapping jurisdiction, should absolutely work together. Um, but I would ask uh, for a legal opinion to make sure that this agreement is, is legal. Um, with respect to the administrative, the rest of the administrative calendar, um, 
I vote no on item number 72, which is the appointment of John Master Marino as controller. Um, uh, this certainly should be something that is done with the new incoming supervisor. Um, I believe he should vote on who the controller of the town of Hempstead is, since he will be um, helping him administer his budget. Um, I did make sure to make uh, the incoming supervisor aware of the personnel calendar um, and urged him to speak on this. Um, but as a matter of principle, uh, under Mr. Master Marino's prior tenure as controller, uh, taxes went up $63.5 million. Our residents can't afford this kind of budget management. Uh, the salary also for the controller that was budgeted by this board for 2020 is $150,000. Uh, again, it was unanimously adopted by this board, but this appointment calls for a salary of $175,000, $25,000 higher than what was put in place. Um, so for these con concerns, uh, and the fact that uh, Mr. Mar Master Marino was the architect of something that was called less savings, something I objected to throughout my tenure, I must vote no on Mr. Master Marino, and I encourage the new incoming supervisor to find a, a better choice. Um, also, with respect to item number 76, which is the personnel calendar, um, I vote yes on the personnel calendar. I congratulate the Tosner uh, people who are finally getting full-time employment. Um, I encourage this board going forward to do what we did in 2018, which is to, to, to bring people up um, periodically throughout the year, not make them wait until the end of the year to become full-time, because this is something that really can make a world of difference in the life of some of our hardworking employees. Um, on, 76, though I do vote no to the following people. Um, Michael Caputo, DGS, admins, DGS has no vacancies uh, right now in this position, and a discretionary raise was not budgeted for by the department. Uh, Jessica Drucker, this bud promotion was not budgeted for in the 2020 budget. Uh, Stephanie Gerber, there are no vacancies or funding available to accommodate this transfer. Uh, Nicholas Giovanelli, uh, discretionary raises were not budgeted for in the unanimously adopted budget for 2020. Matthew Gravanga, the position uh, and the $50,000 salary were considered in the 20, were not considered in the 2020 budget. Ryan Love, this position and the $107,000 salary were not conditioned in the 2020 budget. Michael Russo, discretionary raises were not budgeted for in 2020 budget. Uh, Casey Salmon, this promotion was not budgeted for in the 2020 budget. Ms. Michelle Sparaccio, there is no funding in GGS admin to support this transfer and the raise in the 2020 budget. Gregory uh, Tara de Bono, Bono, discretionary raises were not budgeted for in the 2020 budget. Uh, Alex Vassallo, there is no funding. Alex, I will say, did a great job for Councilman King Sweeney, um, but there is no funding or vacancy in parks to support this transfer. Um, Bruce Blower, uh, the new uh, person being appointed as Director of Communications. Um, I have no opinion about Mr. Bruce Blower's talents or anything like that. Um, however, we have a Director of Communications. I think it would be nice to let her serve out her term and let Mr. Clayman appoint whatever Director of Communication he and the board feel is appropriate for the next uh, the next term of uh, this board. Um, but also, during the past few months, um, I was criticized by the incoming supervisor for hiring people that do not live in the town of Hempstead. Um, and I looked at the personnel action, and Mr. Blower does not live in the town of Hempstead, so I'm not sure Mr. Clayton would support this move. So I think he should weigh in on this in his next, uh, when he takes office. Um, the new hires, transfers, raises, and promotions will increase spending in the DGS admin by over $380,000. Uh, and the Parks Department by $95,000. Um, a press release from the Town Council on October 8th stated that the receiver of taxes, Don Clavin, worked alongside the council members to uh, create a sensible lean 2020 budget propo proposal, yet all of these moves are not in the 2020 budget. Um, they should know what they passed. Um, uh, when I came into office, my budget was put out of whack at the last board meeting to the tune of $2 million. Um, I did not appreciate that. Um, I did write to the incoming supervisor and warned him of this, these moves putting his budget out of whack. I don't think that's good for him. I don't think it's good for the administration. And I don't think it's good for the taxpayer. So I vote no on those individuals. And otherwise, I vote yes on the rest of the administrative council. Councilman Blakeman. 
I vote aye with respect to the administrative calendar with the exceptions of items 68, 69, 84, 85, 86, and 87. Which I vote aye. Councilman D'Esposito. Regarding the administrative calendar, uh, I vote aye. I want to comment on uh, item number 54 and just uh, thank my fellow board members for taking a stance uh, against these uh, criminal first agenda that New York State has put into uh, play. Not only does it uh, put our residents here in the town of Hempstead uh, in danger, but it also puts law enforcement in danger. So I thank you all for supporting this. Um, I also uh, will vote no on 68, 69, 84, 85, 86, 87. I want to welcome Mr. Manchester Marino uh, back to the team. I think he's a uh, great controller. Uh, he brings uh, institutional knowledge, uh, decades of, uh, of working hard for the taxpayers here in the town of Hempstead, and I know that he will be a great addition. Um, and to all of you, I wish you a Merry Christmas, Happy Hanukkah, Happy Holidays, and a blessed 2020. Councilman Dunn. Okay, <clears throat> to the administrative calendar. I vote yes on all the items except for item 68, 69, 84, 85, 86, and 87. But I am especially proud of voting yes for item 54 on my um, entire town board. Being one form of government that's going to stand up for uh, the citizens' rights. So it's uh, no on 68, 69, 84, 85, 86, and 87, and yes on the rest of the calendar. And again, like my colleague said, Merry Christmas, and Happy New Year, and Happy Hanukkah, we will celebrate. Senior Councilwoman Lucy. I'd like to make a statement as far as the Todd's movies is concerned. I know that may not be the uh, right term to wait till the end of the year, but when I first came here, there were many people who had worked here part time for years without any, 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 uh, anything. No time, no uh, comp time, no vacation time, no sick time, or anything. And that is one of the things that I fought for once I became a member of the board. And I have to say that the council people went along with me. And I have to be a Democrat, they were Republican. They went along with me. This is how this was set up. So that everybody, once they have had the opportunity to get themselves ready and have worked and proven that they're good employees, can become full time, and they are. And that's why we have the Cosmo List. It is my baby, and I'm tired of people taking credit for what I have done. And I want to again speak about the Catholic Jesus. Because of the Catholic and because of many of the residents who live in Roosevelt, we have the uh, street stay. And I can prove all of that. We even had a vision where all the residents came in and we used the top thumbtacks and everything to show what we have. I have all that information. So I'm tired of people taking credit for what other people do. It is nice to have people work with you, not take credit for it. And I am voting no on item 68. 69, 85, 86, and 84 to 86, all of those. So you got that? Yeah. Councilman Muscarello. No, I'm not finished. I want to wish everybody a very, very happy New Year, happy Hanukkah, happy Christmas, and I don't have to say happy Kwanzaa, but everybody is invited to come to Kwanzaa on the 20th of this month at 4 p.m. for the wonderful celebration. That's it. Councilman Muscarell. I'm going to vote yes on all the items except 68, 69, 84 through 87, which includes 85, 86. Thank you. Supervisor, I'd like to uh, rise uh, to a point of personal privilege. I would ask everybody to stand, please, for a moment. Uh, it has just come to my attention that one of my constituents, a friend of mine, uh, someone who has been a great resident of the town of Hempstead, just passed. Uh, he's retired police chief Vincent D. Marino. He's from North Valley Stream, and he is the fifth person to die in a week of 9-11 related illnesses. I ask that we have a moment of silence for Chief D. Marino. Thank you. And while we're standing, I would like at this time to 
congratulate our supervisor and our town clerk on their two years of service to the town of Hempstead. Um, putting partisanship aside, it's a tremendous sacrifice to uh, serve the public. It's a lot of time away from your family. And you brought expertise, Laura, and experience uh, to the job and you dedicated a tremendous amount of time to it. Uh, Sylvia, you're just a joy to work with everybody. Like working with you, love working with you. Um, you were a pleasure to be around. Um, and you created a, a real bar around here of goodness. Uh, so I would like to congratulate them. Also wish everybody a Merry Christmas, a Happy Hanukkah, a Happy and Healthy New Year. So let's give an applause to our two outgoing electors. Senior Councilman Gooseby, do you have a motion to adjourn? Yes. Well, before we adjourn, just one more thing. You know, all commissioners, you've done such a great job this year. Absolutely so proud of each and every one of our commissioners for the job you've done for us, the elected officials, and your employees of 8-8. God bless you. What a wonderful, you have such a hard work on staff. And of course, the staff of the board, God bless you. Have a very, very happy And don't forget to have an attorney's office. They've been great. Have an attorney's office. And we have a motion to adjourn. Second. Madam Clerk, Supervisor Gilbert, um, I will say that it has been my privilege and my honor to serve as the supervisor of the town of Hempstead for the past two years. Um, and it's been a pleasure serving alongside Sylvia Cabana, who has been an excellent clerk, who really pushed forward amazing agendas in the clerk's office and tried to make it a really great place to come and visit, where so many of our residents interact. Um, it's been a pleasure to serve with Senior uh, Deputy Supervisor Chris Blakeman. I thank you for your service to the town. We did not always agree on things. Um, but he was always available to talk and try to work things out. I thank you, uh, Deputy Supervisor Blakeman. I wish good luck to the incoming supervisor and the new councilman, Mr. Carini, as well as to the current council members in their next term. Um, I'd like to thank so many of the wonderful men and women that I have met here in the town of Hempstead who have brought so much joy to our time here. Um, whether it's by teaching me new things, like the members of the highway department who taught me how to operate a pay loader, um, who taught me how to operate a chainsaw. Um, you can rest easy knowing that I will not do any of these things again without proper supervision. Um, to the people who just would give a kind word to me, to my staff, to be encouraging. You are so many, so many of you are the unsung heroes of this town. You pick up our garbage, you vacuum, and you are kind, wonderful people, and I want to see you. Um, I want to say thank you to my staff. Um, I don't know how I convinced many of you to come and join me on this journey, um, but I'm so glad that I did. Um, during the campaign, many of you were aligned as patronage hacks, but you leave this place with your head held high, knowing that you were among the brightest, most hardworking, dedicated, greatest talent that have worked in this building, among them. Um, you should be proud, and I am proud of the work that we did together. Um, I believe it was not for naught, and I hope that we leave this town a better place going forward. Um, again, I just want to thank everybody for uh, their kindness during my term here, and, uh, and to my staff, let's move on to the next chapter, starting in about four hours. <laughs> I mean, yes to the Councilman Dunn? Aye. Senior Councilman Guzzi? Aye. Councilman Mosgrove? Aye. Don't make me cry. I think you're trying to supervise what I said about the preservation. So there's no public comment, or this will be my last time to get put out. Are you voting against that? Yes, they will.
the rest of the Wait and see. To see people. No, well, I think that one. Well, I'm showing up one time. <laughs> yes, it's been recorded. <laughs> Are we doing anything? Uh, are we going home or what? You're on candid camera, Mr. Deputy. You're Sorry, it's over. It's over? You're not going to have public comment? I'm going to sit by the What happened? The you, first time you come, freaking hours you come here for public comment and they suspended. They saw you. Next time, hi. You owe me four hours. Four hours, I know. All right. Public comment, Pat Boyle. Yes. Thank you for doing that. Uh, I know we're not doing that. We're here for you. Excuse me. Just a little bit over. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to say, as a matter of fact, I'm going to apologize first because my comments are going to be very boring. And I'm going to have to go back to the office and look at them again. Because my comments are going to be very boring in comparison to what you've heard already today. And I've heard it. Um, I just came here to say thank you. Um, one of the things that I did come to say thank you about was, uh, well, first of all, I have three things. One of them was I wanted to say thank you to Councilman Muscarella, Councilman D'Esposito, and Councilman Dunn, and especially Councilman Blakeman for attending that uh, dedication ceremony yesterday for John Ciotti. Um, John was a friend of mine. And it was the work that we became friends, and I just thought it was great that you guys would come out and um, show your support for him. Second thing I wanted to thank you for is the funding that you gave us over the course of the past year. Um, the town of Hempstead gives us money, $25,000, and what we use it for every year is to be able to run summer programs for young people. Um, there are 200 young people who were involved in our summer programs for the whole month of July. Um, and they, they go from 9 a.m. to 5.30 p.m. So you can imagine what a great thing this is for the residents of that community. And without the money that you give us, we wouldn't be able to do that. So I did want to say thank you for that as well, too. I really appreciate it. And I know the community does as well, too. I, I, another thank you as well, too, for the people who came to our registration for our after-school programs. That was extremely important to me to see you there, because you got an opportunity to be able to see everything that went on. Um, Councilman Muscarella was very generous in going out and taking out of his own pocket and going buying water for the kids who were there, and that was much appreciated by the kids who were there. Um, and, and the support that he gave during the day just trying to help out. Just pointing I lent him that money. <laughs> <laughs> Eight bucks? <laughs> <laughs> and but the person who I really wanted to thank for being there that day is Senior Councilwoman Boosby. It's, it's, not even, it's not even your district, but you were good enough to come out and see what happens to kids in other districts and what we were able to provide for them. And I, I greatly appreciated you being there that day, and I just wanted to say thank you for that. <laughs> well, they were kids, and there were 700 of them who got registered on that particular day, and we saw quite a show of how we get it done. So thank you for doing that as well, too. And then I just wanted to say thank you in general um, to the supervisor for what she's done over the course of the past two years, to all of you and the help that you've given us. And with five seconds left, I'm going to give up and just say thank you, Merry Christmas, Happy Hanukkah, Happy Kwanzaa, and all the other holidays in between. Well, let us say thank you. Hey, thanks for remembering John Ciotti. Uh, he always spoke so highly of you. Really did. So, Adam Hayden from Roslyn. Richard Creron. Heidi Sen. Pearl Jacobs. Stephen Edmondson. I, I got to meet Mr. Well, I like to meet Mr. Name and address. 
He doesn't see homeless singing there. Yeah, homeless. And Dotty, uh, who drives the Jaguar, hangs his house. Who you give awards to. Who's going to get all these people when they come out of jail in her house and all the other homeless shelters in the town of Hempstead? Yes, because I got a soldier twice in that house. And we got the bank robber from DB Bank in that house. Yep. And we're lucky we get milk and bread in that house. Where is the house located? Uh, Bedford Avenue in Uniondale. You know Daphne Haynes? She's got a couple of them. I don't know these people. You gave her an award. What's that name? Daphne Haynes. East Valley Haven. What's the address, please? Uh, so I can get you the correct address. I can give you the office. Why don't you uh, either call the office? Yeah, I'm going to call the office because, I mean, this is ridiculous. I get assaulted twice. One guy is on parole, and I shouldn't have to live in these conditions. And we know both Michael Ryan, who uh, got invited down from the former, well, the former supervisor now to help you with the HUD, I mean, uh, the flooding, but nobody wants to give Michael a paid job. I asked the new supervisor came in, and you can consider Michael Rand because he knows all about the housing issues and the flooding. Maybe you can consider giving him a job, and he'll come back from Florida. But this is going to be a dilemma. With, I mean, with all the minority neighborhoods, as you know, and I'm trying to start a civic association in Roosevelt because they definitely need one. It's jammed down the minority neighborhood with all these shelters put in there. You need the old free point, Roosevelt and Hempstead. It's terrible. You don't see him in Roslyn. You don't see him in Oceanside. And I guess you'll say, thank you. You don't have my required when you get the problem with the hotel down there. You know, I mean, it's unbelievable. And now I'm getting threatened by Daphne Haynes. I mean, none of these shelters are the perfect place to live in. But I mean, it's better than living on the streets. Thank you, Mr. Evanson. Jamie Jordan. Barbara Hafner. Mary Ellen Cray. Pray for 36 Locust Avenue, Uniondale. As a member of the Sierra Club, we question why there has been a delay in installing the Oceanside solar panels at the landfill. Uh, $10,000 was given to the Abu Consultants of Quorum for an efficiency study and analysis. The one-year contract was approved a year ago, December 11, 2018. It would generate a 10 megawatts of electricity for 1,500 homes. It would be 50,000 solar panels. It avoids 10,000 metric tons of carbon dioxide per year. And now our air contains 440 parts of carbon dioxide per million parts of air. The tipping point is 350 parts per million. So now, has a report been sent by Clearview? That's my first question. Yes, it has. When did you last hear from them? I would say within the month and that it's being reviewed. It also has to go out to the community. I mean, it's, it's a big undertaking to take a landfill and make it a solar farm. Um, the people that live in Oceanside and the surrounding areas have dealt with the landfill for decades. It's something that has been um, part of their skyline, so to speak, and when something like that is going to change and affect their quality of life and what they see each and every day, I want to make sure it's done correctly. So are you the person on the board who's responsible for the contacts? Well, I am the representative of the Oceanside community, so yes. yes. And uh, were any other places considered? I don't believe so. Not, not as part of, of this um, consultation. Uh, to go on to another subject, 
I uh, feel that uh, considering Mr. Edmondson's comment, I renew my call for housing programs in the future to provide full day activities for their residents because otherwise they just flop houses. When they just throw their people out on the streets all during the day, as you well know, senior councilwoman, our communities have to deal with people who have nothing to do and it's not a good scene. That's something that we need to work out with the Nassau County because they're paying for those people to stay in those places and they know what, what the consequences are. It comes out through social services. I have met with the new director of social services and she promised me that we're going to work together and see if there's something that can be done. But it definitely is social service and really Yvonne is responsible for that over the area. I think if we start here and make the movement grow and go, uh, we can... But not in the not on our jurisdiction. I understand that. Uh, I'm crushed, absolutely crushed, by the votes against the hearings for the tree preservation resolutions. There's I just do not understand. It's going to be discussed again with the board uh, when Supervisor-elect Clayton takes office. I would like to... So that's what we have to do. Sorry? We're going to discuss it with him when he comes in. We're not going to let that go. Um, for, uh, I'd like to thank Supervisor Gillen, Town Clerk Cabana, Commissioner Backage for their leadership and service. I've appreciated the time that they've put into it, and I would like to note the passing of Marie Catanese, a Uniondale supporter of uh, the community and the children of the community. I wish you all the very best for the holidays. Thank you, thank you, Ms. Craig. And thank you for coming and bringing us up today. Valerie Lamb. All the way to St. Augustine. Valerie Lamb, St. Augustine. Um, I forgot to congratulate everybody. Congratulations to the new incoming elected officials, as well as the re-elected officials, and as well as the entire board. Uh, I believe that this is a, a huge opportunity to get things done. Um, I believe that you'll be able to work very well together, collaborate with each other, uh, and be respectful towards one another. And I look forward to that. So uh, even though I live in Florida now, why am I here, right? I know, I, I, I've been asked this all day and I realize that everyone's confused. <laughs> but I find everyone's confusion kind of confusing because I'm here for the animals. <laughs> it's the same reason I came here for two and a half years, almost every meeting. Um, animal welfare, as my good friend likes to say, is not a right or left issue. It is a right or wrong issue. And so to that note, myself as well as a couple of other Long Island animal advocates have decided to form a PAC, not a wolf pack, uh, a political action committee. This is going to impact all of you, Councilman Dunn, Senior Councilman Gooseby, Councilman Diaz-Pizzito, Councilman Muscarella, new Councilman Mr. Carini, and within the town of Hempstead, what we want to see is progress. We want to see the actual reforms at the shelter. Um, and this PAC is going to be able, it's technically a multi-candidate um, committee. So we're going to be able to endorse as many elected as officials as we want. We're going to be charging a membership fee, an annual membership fee, and I've already reached out to corporations and I have over $10,000 so far in um, verbal commitments because I can't take the money just yet. That said, what we want is a new, compassionate, and qualified director. We want an overhaul of the behavior department so that there's less bite cases, less returns, less injuries, less Utica. Let's just talk about that, okay? We want an operational audit. We want CAPA. It's been submitted to the board. You guys have it. You've had it for over a year, which Regina drew it up. And We'd like to get that passed. Uh, mobile TNR unit, I know that's in the process, and we want to celebrate you guys. We want to support you people, not just monetarily, 
But as you can probably gather, I'm a pretty good supporter. I'll go to your fundraisers. We want to support you with boots on the ground, door knocking, our own version of your campaign and commercials. We can also advertise against your competitors. This is an opportunity for everybody to win, especially the animals. And before I forget, I would like to revisit sending money to Ulster County Canines. I'm sorry, I'm just, like, I can make the case and say that someone else got an extra two and a half minutes. But anyway, Ulster County Canines is a not-for-profit. This is the good place that is rehabilitating animals that were sent away from the town of Hempstead. They were, they, the town paid $3,000 a dog to ship them off to that hellhole in Utica, where they ended up um, getting shut down for the deplorable conditions. So I'm asking the town to please send the good people that are rehabilitating the dogs, which is what the first place was supposed to do. Thank you, Ms. Lamb. Uh, and the anti-puppy mill legislation. So, Merry Christmas. Please, let's all work together, and we can all win. Thank you. Ann Myers. <laughs> Joanne Sanders. Ronald Whitfield. <laughs> Stuart Kroll. <laughs> Mr. Jay Blackman. <laughs> Diane Madden. Thank you, Madam Hempstead. I'm actually going to reserve most of the things I was going to speak about uh, for the incoming uh, supervisor. I'm excited uh, for a new era, and I look forward to it. Um, something that he said when I stood next to him at several debates was impressive, and I think it was impressive to voters, that he said in all of his years, 18 or more, his office never had a scandal. And that struck me, and that impressed me. And I think that everyone's going to have to work together to ensure, in his new position, that there is never a scandal. So again, I'm going to pass on these comments and questions that I had, um, only to say, because of a very misleading um, press statement that I saw recently, and I apologize, I'm going to ask you to say it again on record, um, and the statement read something about the board passing part-time part work. I just want to confirm again, uh, because it, it does reflect poorly on the board to make a statement like that, that this board does not, is not required to pass part-time work throughout the town of Hempstead. Are you asking if we vote on part-timers? Correct. We, we do not. It's part of the, in the budget. Right. It's when we vote on the budget that's the part timers. Right, but not specifically on each part timer. No. Okay, I just wanted to clarify that again as I have in the past. And uh, Happy New Year. Again, I look forward to working together, uh, especially working with the new supervisor and one of my favorites, the union president. And uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Happy holidays. Wilhelmia Funderburg. Denise Riggio, Lucille Defina. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, hi, my name is Denise Riggio. I'm from uh, Valley Street. Good afternoon. Yeah. Um, so this is my second meeting that I've ever attended. Um, so I'm still trying to learn and understand how things work. Um, so in that vein, I'm hoping that this um, board will continue um, in the same vein that um, Ms. Skillen was doing in terms of transparency and openness. Um, I have some concerns that we can't um, query the, the minutes and easily find topics that we need. Um, in looking at the request for proposals, um, it would be beneficial to have the information about whether or not the owners of, uh, who, the own, who the companies made the bid, who all the companies that made the bids, but in addition to who the owners are, if the owners are related to anybody within the town of Hempstead or the employees that are here. 
um, and make that information public as well. So um, I know that there's um, lots of opportunities here for us to improve transparency. Um, I am concerned that we're voting on things that, for example, were um, from 2019. There seem to be several of those items in, in the minutes. I don't fully understand why that is. That was just accepting donations for the calendar that gets sent out in the 2019 year. So, so maybe it would be beneficial if the minutes were a little bit more robust. Sure. Um, so that we could actually understand what it is that um, that is up for discussion. Um, there's a lot of, um, again, bids in here that are being approved. It's unclear to me what year they're covering. Um, to hear the supervisor say that her budget was blown at the end of the year is concerning. Um, I don't get to blow my house budget at the end of the year. I don't think the town should blow theirs. Um, so to hear that that's potentially or actually actually happening for the next incoming supervisor is also discouraging. So now we're perpetuating that. Well, all the information that was given up by the supervisor is an old factual. Um, if you could clarify for me, stop the clock and clarify for me what was it factual. Well, I can't go through each and every um, transfer for personnel, but oh, just not to say overall that. that our budget is blown, it, it's not really a, a factual statement. Um, I, I can appreciate that, and I'm not looking for details of individual employees. What I'm saying is a matter of operational procedures. To be approving things at the end of the year that were not in your budget means that you don't have the money for it. So that means my taxes are going up, so that's a concern. So again, I'm not looking for individual information. I'm just saying for the end of year um, meeting to have things that were incurring additional expenditures that were never approved or budgeted for. Um, let me rephrase that, that were not budgeted for previously and slipping them in is, is troubling. Um, so I do hope that um, this incoming administration and those of you who are repeating will continue to um, have that level of transparency because I think that um, more and more people want that information and it's really hard to get your hands on it and it shouldn't be because we pay you. One of the things you have to realize is we cannot help what somebody else says what she says, she said. You don't know what she's going to say. She wrote all of the things down that she said. It's just like what I said. Many times, many of the uh, differences and so forth that have been done here, I did them. But then other people come in and they did them, and they did not. So I usually just sit and don't say anything, but this time I did because I know what I did. I work very hard, and I make sure that I know what's going on in my community. You don't know all of the invites that are some people start. But I'm trying to keep quiet because I like to work with people and I know what's important here. The important thing to me is making sure sure take care of our residents. Uh, that's what's important. I would agree. So some, what you're saying, sometimes we cannot say anything about what you're saying. It's like, if, I'm sure you work in a corporation or something, there are some things that others that you work with would say something that you cannot repeat. Or if they said something you know it's not true, you cannot say it's not true. So that's the way things happen. That's, that's fair, um, just mm -hmm. my observation here. I watched uh, two different communities come up and try to protest businesses being opened um, in their community that they didn't want. So that's a testament needed to do things for the people in the community and listening to them. Um, I am concerned that the people of Bethpage, which is the wealthier community, got more um, airtime um, than the people from Roosevelt. And I'm not from There were a lot more people here. Uh, talking for. But this guy spoke for oh, an, an hour without. Oh, it's no, no, no. Like that, that's their presentation. That's right. that's Presentations can have as much time as they want. Okay. That's the attorney and the developer. They can present if their presentation is three minutes or three hours. We have to sit here. But when the, the public speaks, it's in the rules of the town of Memphis said that each person gets three minutes. So there's definitely nobody's getting treated better than anybody else. I just hope that we continue to listen to the constituents in the community. I mean, to hear that there's a 7-Eleven on one corner, we're going to build another one. It's like I can't understand what you're saying. To, 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 to not listen to residents in the community um, and to table things for later discussion when they may or may not be here. Seems well, we need to do that sometimes. We have, like you said, we have to follow the rules and regulations, too. We, are, we all take an oath, and we're guided by the laws of the state of New York. There are some things that we cannot uh, discuss with you if you come back later, but we cannot because there may be something that's not, you know, correct. I mean, I asked the last meeting for the operating procedures, and I we cannot. You can get a book if you order from the state of New York. They have a book on uh, town law. Okay, if if 
someone could provide that information to me that way. Well, you could go you could go online and find all the books that are listed by the government. We don't make the book. The town they uh, I, I will have Ms. Mr. Regina, who's the counsel to the town board, um, get in touch with you. Do you mind throwing your email on here? And I do come from a corporate world, so we, yes, there's laws and regulations that we have to follow, but that's like, that's like sending me looking for needle in a haystack. It's really about starting with your operating procedures from the bottom up. Do the operating procedures make sense? Um, things like tabling things indefinitely. That doesn't make sense. You know, you know what I'm saying? Like there's... Mr. Regina will reach out to you, no problem. That would be helpful. Thank you. Lucille Defina, she's not like... Rochelle Kevelson. Ms. Meredith? <laughs> Me, Jim Meredith, welcome, President. Um, in closing out this year, um, as we're talking about histories and December, and since I was born on Christmas, Christmas, December is all about me. Um, but I will share it with my ongoing concern, veterans, and as we're talking about our wish list for 2020, and we're talking about how we're funding, whether the funds, as the outgoing supervisor mentioned, I would guess that she would know what the numbers were in her budget. Um, but our concerns are also with regard to a, a coming year and still not seeing much in the way of improvements as it pertains to the needs of our veterans um, and their families um, and the resources that seem to be distributed in various areas. And I was deeply troubled to read a news day recently about the governor's concern um, about the critical issue um, with regard to scallops in our waterways. Um, but we have veterans who are um, soon to be living in the streets and this whole situation with SNAP benefits that impacts the food assistance that is provided to 1.5 million veterans and their families um, who stand to lose on those resources. So my concern, as it has been in the past, is looking to what this township and those of you who are elected, those of you have, who have been returned, those of you who have been elected, um, to step up those efforts to actually make a concerted difference and to, if nothing else, educate yourself as to the impact of the lack of diversity and inclusion as it pertains to our veteran community. And as I said earlier, uh, women of color comprise the largest recruiting block in the military, particularly African American women. They're also the largest block in startup businesses and they have the least in receipts. Um, we can talk about the million dollars that could have been used for roads, but we're not even fixing the roads in the township. They are atrocious. Mechanics, I guess that's why we have so many petitions and requests for auto mechanics, because the, the way cars are being traumatized on these roads is just unsightly for what we have to address, paying the second highest taxes when we're talking about Nassau County. So I'm wishing everybody well and healthy and things of that nature, but since I had to help clean out a home that's still trying to get back on track that's emptied out from Superstorm Sandy, I'm still concerned about those who are underserved and underrepresented. So I do hope that we will step up those efforts so that I will see more results um, that pertain to getting that fixed and addressed before tragedy ensues right in our very neighborhoods. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Mary. I wish you a healthy new year. Felix Prakashi. I can't speak to all the items that Supervisor Gillen brought up about the out-of-budget items, but I can tell you one that comes to mind in 2013 when we passed the budget. There was no budget in raises for the council people. There was no budget for raise for the supervisor. Right after the 2013 budget was over, after the 2000 election was over, they gave themselves raises that were out of the budget. They took it out of the, you know, the fund balance. So that's done on a regular basis all, all the time. And 
And there's been many cases in your council. Yeah, Goosby wants to know if you're proposing she gets a raise. No, I'm proposing a deduction because uh, you, you spend out of budget all the time. And I've looked at many hires that you put on. I don't go through every one. It would be very time consuming. But there would be nobody in a certain position. And then you would hire somebody. And I would go back to the previous budget, you know, the previous year where the budget was passed. And there was no position for that. That happens all the time. That's regular thing. So, whether everything she says is accurate, I can't speak to it because I'd have to go through it. But you do this, this board has done this for years before your time. You know, it's just standard operating procedure over here. Um, as far as following the laws of New York State, allowing a commissioner to approve a $50,000 expenditure is in violation of state law. The, your, your, it's your job to appropriate money. It's very clear whether it's hundred dollars, it's ten dollars and fifty cents. And for a park, when they hire part-timers, it's on the resolutions, it's on the calendar. So you supposed to do it because it's money. It's money when you you because you change the budget before the November fifth, November fourth meeting, you eliminated part-timers, you could bring them all back and nobody would ever know. And then you, you gave a false tax cut, and you're just going to take that money out of fund balance. So you're really fooling the public. And you, you, this board, not just you, this board has done this for years. You, I go back 20 years. I've looked up people 20 years, and I've seen you've been doing this. So you know, don't tell people false information because it's not, you know, it's not true. You, you don't follow your own budget all the time. And I want to bring up one more thing. Because this is very important. I went through, I spent hours last night. This is the state law, the, the bail reform act, including the discovery rules, um, then set of laws, and then there's dissertations people give. Passing that resolution, I, I disagree with parts of this law. I read the whole freaking thing, eh? all 18 pages. It's very difficult because it's all marked up and everything. They have the cross out still there. I couldn't find a clean copy online. I think if you're going to make a proposal to New York State, and this is for your own benefit, be specific. Read through how you have a million attorneys here. Read through it and specifically say, where is it bad? Thank you, Mr. Prakashi. Anyone else? Did, did you call it? One more. One more. I have a card. I didn't fill that card before, but I was just like... It's not in here. Come on up. I apologize. We just read what we're given. Marsha D. Thierry, Merrick, New York. Um, I just wanted to make a statement on the administrative calendar 85 to 87 regarding tree preservation that I really thought board members here and councilman Dundee, my councilman, seeing so many properties being subdivided, every tree being cut down, global warming, pollution, and everyone voted no, except the supervisor. I don't get it. It's all our lives. It's our environment. It's our health. And there will be nothing left for future generations if you let these developers destroy everything that's good and green. So I'm just asking you to reconsider your vote. And for a future of the town has said, not big mansions, not higher taxes because these homes are so big. Just regular people wanting to enjoy nature, clean air, clean water. And, the future. and it will definitely be reconsidered when the new supervisor takes office. Thank you. Anyone else? Hello everyone, uh, my name is Shayla Ramos from Island Park, New York. Um, so this is my second time ever coming to a town hall meeting. Um, I just want to say wow. Uh, I'm learning a lot and I want to say thank you to all of you um, for doing what, what you do. Um, but especially uh, Supervisor Gillen, I appreciate the transparency that she um, has put forward, and I want to give a special shout out to um, Sylvia Cabana. Thank you so much for being, you know, Latina representation. I really feel like uh, we need more uh, minority representation. Um, 
um, especially in time I'm said. And I'm definitely going to get more involved. And I, you know, I want to learn. I want to make sure that the new supervisor coming in um, does what he says he's going to do. And um, you know, I hear the concerns of all the people here. And you know, thank you for doing what you do. And I really think that the 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 tree thing should have been passed. Um, I don't know why there was a weight on that. Um, and also, certain things that have been happening, I, I don't know, people need to be held accountable. But thank you, Supervisor Gillen, so the Cabana, for all you do. And um, yeah, congratulations to the new council coming in. Thank you. Happy holidays. And I too want to thank Madam Clerk for a job well done. Have a great holiday, everybody.